Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. Tonight's show is brought to you by NatureBox. Order great tasting, healthy snacks and get them delivered right to your door. Forget the vending machine, enjoy healthy, delicious treats like banana bread granola and a whole lot more. Support this show, you get 50% off your first order. Just go to naturebox.com slash thinking atheist. That's naturebox.com slash thinking atheist. If you're going to be anywhere near North Carolina this coming weekend, I'm doing six tour stops in three days. It's going to be a whirlwind, and it's going to be awesome. We start on Saturday morning in Wilmington, North Carolina, and then Columbia, South Carolina, Saturday night. Sunday, it's Asheville and Charlotte, and then Monday, Greensboro and Raleigh-Durham, North Carolina. All the information, sponsors, locations, everything on my website, go to thethinkingatheist.com. And then click the Events tab and you'll see all the information right there. Tonight's broadcast is actually the audio of an event that happened on May 31st in Memphis, Tennessee at the Marriott East Grand Ballroom in front of a live audience. It was a debate between atheist Matt Dillahunty and presuppositional apologist Cy Ten Bruggenkate. Now these guys have been sparring kind of off and on for a long time. And the second it was announced, it was sponsored by Recovering from Religion and American Atheists. The second it was announced, it polarized the free thought community. Some people said, finally, what a great idea. We get a chance to see both of these guys on stage going head to head, making their points, making their presentations. And uh, we can actually see these arguments made for the record. We can't wait to be there. In fact, many people drove hundreds of miles just to be in the audience that night. And other people said, why are you doing this? This is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. Why would you bother with the presuppositionalist argument? And two, why would you give Cy Ten Bruggen Kate and Eric Hovind, who was also in the audience, and he brought a video camera, was doing some interviews and stuff, why would you give these guys any more exposure and any more fame? Because we think fame is what they crave above all. And that's a valid concern. For my part, I was asked to be the videographer of the event, and I was glad that the exchange happened for two reasons. One, I thought Matt did a wonderful job of presenting really good information. I mean, even if Cy hadn't been in the room, had it not been a debate, if it had just been a presentation, I thought his content was rich and it helps us in our discussions, or at least helps to further the conversation about how we determine what is real, how do we determine knowledge, what do we accept, how do we vet claims, those types of deals. And the second thing is, I've seen the presuppositional apologist argument become kind of like the buzzing insect. You know, it's extremely lightweight, it's insignificant, but it's become enough of an annoyance that occasionally you have to stop and swat it so you can get on with other things. I mean, presup is essentially personal experience. I had a personal experience. I've been given personal divine revelation that tells me that the scriptures are authentic and absolutely true. Therefore, I presuppose it to be true and I reject all else. It's a personal experience argument and it can be easily discounted. But there's a lot of noise out there about the precepts and I thought it was a good idea to finally Go ahead and address it head on. The official video version of that exchange is linked in the description box of this podcast, but a lot of people said they wanted a podcast version, an audio-only version. They said, look, I'm a podcast listener, I do a lot of driving, or I like to listen while I work or whatnot. Can you present the audio of that night in a podcast? And I said, absolutely, I'd be more than happy to do it. And it's a long exchange. I think uh, they had opening statements at 10 minutes each, then 10-minute rebuttals, and then they had a chance to sort of each own blocks of time as they questioned each other, finally going to audience Q&A after that. And I think it ran almost two hours. Some of it will be hard for many of you to get through. 
Hell, I was the videographer. Some of it was hard for me to get through. Especially when you hear the repetitions of, how do you know that? How do you know what's real? How do you know that? How do you know that? Where does your knowledge come from? The implication being, of course, that knowledge can only come from a knowledge giver, an absolute standard giver. And those types of arguments are tedious. I mean, I'll understand when you get frustrated. But Matt brought a lot of really good responses, and I thought he did a good job of addressing the topic at hand. The topic of the debate was, is it reasonable to believe that God exists? And he actually addressed the question beyond, I just know. I will make to you the same guarantee that I made to the video audience, and that is that tonight's audio has not been edited for time or content. What you are hearing is the exchange as it happened. In fact, on the video version, I did uh, like four cameras for the official edit, right? We're cutting from face to face to wide shot to mid shot to give people variety to make it interesting to look at. But to allow everyone to know that it has not been edited for content, I also linked to a single wide camera that had not been cut or edited so that if any doubters wanted to verify, they could go in and they could put both feeds side by side to make sure that what they are seeing is what actually happened. And you have that same guarantee tonight. And I'll start that audio in 60 short seconds. First, I want to do due diligence and say a huge thank you out to tonight's sponsor. NatureBox is a terrific way to snack smarter and eat better. And it's also a hugely convenient way to do so because they've got an awesome website. You can just go to naturebox.com slash thinking atheist and you're going to see over a hundred different snacks listed by category and there's pictures and there's descriptions of everything and you can just go decide what you're hungry for. Stuff like peppery pistachios and honey mesquite almonds and everything bagel sticks, teriyaki twists, dark chocolate berry trail mix and a whole lot more zero trans fats zero high fructose corn syrup nothing artificial and they ship free anywhere and everywhere in the united states right to your door you could even choose what size nature box you want is it just for you? Well, you want the smaller order? That's cool. You have a big family? You can get a larger box and have this stuff delivered right to you. Healthy snacks that taste good, selected by you, and delivered to your door. Support our sponsor and this podcast and get 50% off your first box. Go to naturebox.com slash thinkingatheist. That's naturebox.com slash thinkingatheist. And now tonight's podcast... The debate between Matt Delahunty and Cy Ten Bruggenkate. The topic of the debate, is it reasonable to believe that God exists? The debate will begin with two ten-minute opening statements, starting with Cy. Don't start yet. <laughs> you got the volume on my uh, laptop there? Wonderful. Nine minutes, 52 seconds. I'm kidding. <laughs> And time. Jesus Christ is king. And I thank him for allowing this debate to take place tonight. Is it reasonable to believe that God exists? Yes. Yes, it is. I'm going to argue tonight that not only is it reasonable to believe that God exists, but that denying belief in God reduces one's worldview to absurdity. Well, why is it reasonable to believe that God exists? Quite simply, because it's true that he exists. Here's my argument. Premise one, it's reasonable to believe that which is true. Premise two, it's true that God exists. Conclusion, therefore, it's reasonable to believe that God exists. Now, in order for an argument to be sound, it must not only be valid in form, but the premises must be true. Now, I highly doubt that Matt is gonna argue against the validity of the form of the argument or the truth of the first premise. It's reasonable to believe that which is true. I mean, that's the very definition of reason. The intellectual ability to apprehend the truth. See, I suspect that the disagreement is going to come from the second premise. Matt is going to want me to show that it's true that God exists. I mean, I've watched a lot of video with Matt recently, and truth is very important to him. I care about what's actually true. My, my only concern is, uh, or my primary concern, is whether or not a belief's true. I, I actually give a shit about whether or not something's true. <laughs> truth is the thing that I value most. Matt values truth so much that he even put on a t-shirt. He wants to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible. Well, so do I. 
And guess what? I say it's true that God exists. Therefore, it is true that God exists. My argument is sound and the debate is over. How does that work for you, Matt? Saying something doesn't make it true. Oh. Saying something doesn't make it true. Well, how's this? It's true for me that God exists. Therefore, it's true that God exists. I'm talking about the, the idea that something could be true because it's true for you. That's, not, that's, that's the thing that I'm actually rejecting. Hmm. Just because it's true for me doesn't mean it's true. Oh, well. I strongly feel it's true that God exists. Therefore, God exists. Just because you feel it strongly doesn't mean that it's true. Hmm. Not feelings either. Well, lots of people believe that God exists, and they're very sincere, and it's really looked down upon to not believe that God exists. So that must make it true. Right? The truth is not impacted in any way by the number of people to believe it, that believe it, the claim, or the sincerity of their belief, or how much it's looked down upon. Oh, man. Not because I said it, not because it's true for me, not because I feel it, not because others believe it, not because the belief is sincere, or because its denial is frowned upon. Come on. Help me out here, Matt. When we're talking about truth and the fact that truth has to exist independent of our knowledge of it, yes, that's true. Oh, okay. Now we're getting somewhere. Truth exists independent of our knowledge of it. Perhaps at this point, a definition of truth would be in order. How does Matt define truth? Truth is that which comports with reality. Truth is that which comports with reality. Great. Wait a minute. Whose view of reality? In my view of reality, God exists. And I really, really believe that my view of reality is the right view. Does that make it true? You can, yeah. believe that, that you can believe that naked pixies whisper in your ear and clean out your sink at night if you want to. <laughs> but it has no bearing at all on the objective reality that we actually have to deal with. Oh, okay, I get it. Objective reality. What's really real. Not just because I believe it. Truth must be that which corresponds to objective reality. Well, that makes sense, actually. Just because somebody high on drugs believe that there's snakes on the bed doesn't mean that there's actually snakes on the bed. In order to know if something's true, our internal beliefs must, ma must match what's actually true, what's actually real. I want my internal model of reality to match the actual reality I live in as best as possible. Of course he does. It has to match actual, objective, ultimate reality to be true. Matt cares about truth, so he must care about ultimate reality, right? I don't care whether this is the ultimate reality. Wait, what? Matt doesn't care if this is the ultimate reality? Surely that was a slip of the tongue. Surely Matt must care a little bit about what's ultimately real. Possibilities and reality. Uh, I don't care. I, I, sorry, I just really, really, really don't care. He really, really, really doesn't care. Now, folks, that's a problem. Truth is that which is ultimately real, and Matt doesn't care what's ultimately real. Why is that? Why doesn't Matt care what's ultimately real? My position is that, yes, we cannot distinguish whether or not, I can't distinguish whether the reality I experience is an ultimate reality. I could be in a matrix or a brain of that or Pick any thought experiment you want. Matt doesn't care what's ultimately real because he can't know what's ultimately real. You heard it. He could be a brain in a vat. According to Matt's worldview, he can only know that which is in his own brain. See, I'd even argue that point. But surely, that would be absurd. I mean, isn't that solipsism? Solipsism. A theory and philosophy that your own existence is the only thing that is real or that can be known. Well, that's nuts, right? I mean, anybody who claims to be a solipsist deserves to be mocked, right? And because I'm a solipsist, because I'm in certain- You're a solipsist? Crap like most people. <laughs> mocked, mocked, and hung up on. Good job, Matt. I mean, that's crazy. I mean, if that were the case, not only could you not know ultimate reality, you'd have no basis for trusting the reality that you think you're experiencing. I mean, 
You might think that you're in a room with blue walls when you're a brain in a vat in a room with orange walls. You see, I have watched a lot of Matt's videos, and he hangs up on a lot of people. Now why, why would Matt hang up on the solipsist? Why would he hang up on the solipsist, I wonder. We, can't, we cannot ever solve the problem of hard solipsism, pretending that I'm claiming to be able to defeat hard solipsism. There's, I, I have no solution to that. Matt has no solution for solipsism. In fact, according to Matt's worldview, he must be a solipsist. But rather than admit it, he mocks somebody claiming solipsism. Of course, Matt would never admit to being a solipsist. Or would he? Obviously, I'm not a solipsist, you're not a solipsist, but in some possible world, actually, kind of there actually is. Did you catch that? It's kind of soft. I, I enhanced the audio for you. Obviously, I'm not a solipsist, you're not a solipsist, but in some possible world, actually, kind of there actually is. Actually, he kind of is a solipsist. Of course he is. Matt can't know anything outside his own brain. And I have to show that it's true that God exists. He can't know anything outside his own brain, and he's going to argue that it's unreasonable to believe in God? My friends, this debate isn't over. It never started. Matt's worldview isn't down for the count. It's dead. It just doesn't have the courtesy to lie down. You see, you need to be able to know what's ultimately real to know what's true. I submit that you can't know what's ultimately real without revelation from God. How do I know what's real? The same way all of you do. Revelation from the God that all of you know exists. Christians profess that truth. Professed atheists suppress it. You see, becoming a Christian is not a matter of going from unbelief to belief. It's a matter of going from suppressing the truth to professing it. No one becomes a Christian and says, well, what do you know? There is a God. You see, God doesn't send people to hell for denying what they don't know, but for their sin against the God they do know. Is it reasonable to believe that God exists? Yes. Yes, it is. Why? Because it's true that God exists. And denial of that claim reduces one's worldview to absurdity. Matt says that truth is that which comports with reality. He admits he can't know what's ultimately real. Therefore, according to his worldview, he can't know anything to be true and has zero basis for challenging my claim that it's reasonable to believe that God exists. Thank you. So, good evening and thank you very much for attending this debate. Is it reasonable to believe God exists? That's the topic we're meant to be addressing tonight. I think it's a great question worthy of discussion and debate. Not just because it'd be very nice to have an answer to the question, but because it affords us the opportunity to address the method by which we might go about answering that question. I'm going to lay the groundwork for my position by addressing two key words in tonight's topic, reasonable and belief. I fully expect to cover some rather dense philosophical topics this evening, and I'll do my best to be clear without being overly pedantic, but I expect that to be difficult. What does it mean to say that something's reasonable? In simplest terms, it means we have good justification for accepting the proposition. It means that we should be able to construct an argument supporting the position that is both valid and sound. And by valid, I mean the position rests solidly on the pillars of reason, a foundation sometimes referred to as the logical absolutes. And it's worth noting that as far as I'm aware, Sai and I actually agree that these logical absolutes are true, but we'll not get into that later. And by sound, I mean that our position is supported by evidence, that the premises are true or accepted as true, and that they are not merely unsupported or unsupportable assertions. Well, what does it mean to say somebody believes something? In simplest terms, it means that we've become convinced that the proposition is true. Philosophers have toiled over the definition of knowledge, and while there are many unresolved issues, there are two things that are generally conceded. The first is that knowledge is a subset of belief. One of the most common definitions of knowledge is justified true belief, and this is because Plato argued that nothing counts as knowledge if it isn't believed, isn't true, and isn't justified, which makes knowledge a subcategory of belief. The second point that's generally conceded is that absolute certainty isn't a required component of knowledge because we have no good reason to think that absolute certainty in the ultimate sense is possible to attain. 
I'm a bit of a philosophy buff, and I think I like thinking about knowledge and certainty and other topics that might arise tonight. But when it comes to propositional claims in general, and the topic of this debate specifically, knowledge and certainty are completely irrelevant. We don't wait until we have knowledge to act, and we don't wait until we have absolute certainty to act. We act in accordance with our beliefs, and we recognize that because our beliefs inform our actions and that our actions have consequences, it's in our best interest to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible, making our internal map of reality as accurate as possible. Ensuring that our beliefs are reasonable is the important issue, and it's the subject of tonight's debate, which means that every time my opponent addresses knowledge or absolute certainty instead of belief and reasonableness, he's actually waving a big red herring around. He might be engaged in some debate, but he's no longer engaged in this debate. So why is it that I don't think it's reasonable to believe that a God exists? First, because the claim hasn't been demonstrated to be reasonable. And by that, I mean whenever we're presented with a claim, the default position is one of not believing. This is the reasonable starting point, because if we begin by believing every claim, we'll wind up believing claims that are contradictory, and that way madness lies. Belief is the state of being convinced and is the result of becoming convinced. And we can become convinced for good reasons or bad reasons. We can become convinced rather quickly, or it might take some time. As I noted earlier, it's in our best interest to have good reasons, which is the topic of tonight's debate. Reasonableness is demonstrated by constructing arguments supported by evidence in such a way that they are valid and sound. I have yet to be presented any argument or evidence that combined to form a valid and sound argument for the existence of God, and this is the primary reason that I don't believe any gods exist and why I believe it's unreasonable to accept that they do. Not to be glib, but if this were ever to become the case, it would be worldwide news and it would change the face of philosophical and scientific inquiry forever. What we have instead is a history of apologists presenting arguments, having those arguments rebutted or rejected, then going back to the drawing board, restructuring that argument to avoid or obfuscate the problems, and then pulling it back out again, dusting it off and presenting it. This is a prime example of leading the evidence towards your preferred conclusion rather than following the evidence where it leads. This cycle has been repeated so many times and for so long that I think there's actually a good argument to be made that there are no gods, especially as none of them have stepped in to correct this bumbling cycle of inadequate defenses. <laughs> I suspect that this will be amplified tonight. The presuppositionalists don't offer evidence. Some even think it's sinful to do so. They merely presuppose that a god exists, assert that it's true, claim that everyone knows that god exists, claim that they can't be wrong, and then set themselves up as the standard bearers for their unsubstantiated solutions to the puzzles that plague philosophers. At a minimum, though, the fact that the cycle continues is confirmation that we do not yet have reasonable justification to believe that a God exists. If it were demonstrable, if it was demonstrably reasonable, excuse me, the trend would be toward less dissent and more believers, when in reality, the opposite is true. Second, I don't believe it's reasonable to believe God exists because I've been offered no way of distinguishing between the various God claims to figure out which, if any, are true. Within Christianity alone, there are over a thousand denominations. Combine this with all the various religions that currently exist, as well as the ones that no longer exist, and you have seemingly countless competing claims about gods and no reliable pathway to the truth of any of them. And this doesn't begin to address the various gods that might be proposed in the future. They can't all be right, but they can all be wrong. David Hume famous to, famously told us that revelation is necessarily first person, and to everyone else it's hearsay. While many Christians claim divine revelation, some even claiming that the truth has been revealed to them in such a way that there's no possibility that they could be wrong, there's hardly any points of doctrine upon which all these purported conduits of divine revelation agree, which means that some, if not all of them, are wrong. And if you want to know what's wrong with Judaism, you ask a Christian. If you want to know what's wrong with Christianity, ask a Muslim. If you want to know what's wrong with Catholicism or Protestantism or Calvinism, hyper-Calvinism, neo-Calvinism, Southern Baptist, the Church of Christ, or the First Baptist Church of Memphis, you can go to the Second Baptist Church of Memphis or any other <laughs> denomination. They offer no verifiable method by which we can determine the truth of their claims. They use similar labels, similar holy books, and they band together against similar perceived enemies, but they offer no reasonable justification for anyone to accept their claims as they fight about those claims amongst themselves. After a lengthy discussion attempting to do just that, they retreat back to, you have to have faith, or God has revealed it to me, or some other epistemologically vapid response. Third reason I don't believe it's reasonable to believe God exists is because there doesn't appear to be any way to demonstrate supernatural causation. Science often comes under fire from religious apologists for a variety of reasons, including that which that what, the things that science tells us often changes as we learn more. As an aside, while we're talking about changing and refining views, Sai may bring up things I've said in the past, but he's most likely arguing against straw mat and is once again engaged in some debate other than this one. If he digs around, he can find quotes of me as a Christian, but it'd be better if he addresses the positions I'm actually defending here. 
I'm not the one asserting a rigid mindset impervious to clarification, and it's possible that he's misunderstood or that I have changed or refined my position, as we'd hope science-minded folks would do as I apologized to the solipsist that we hung up on. Some mistakenly say that science is a religion of materialism or naturalism. In truth, science is founded on the intellectual honest recognition of the limits of our ability to investigate, and it relies on methodological naturalism, not philosophical naturalism. The distinction is important. Philosophical naturalism holds that the supernatural doesn't exist, that the natural world is all that exists. Methodological naturalism holds that we cannot confirm supernatural causation and that we are limited to exploring naturalistic explanations. Yet somehow many theists are running around claiming to be little god detectors, capable of determining supernatural causation as well as divine guidance and instruction, many claiming that they can't be wrong, yet none of them can offer any sort of testable mechanism by which we can verify this. It may be the case that we can never verify the supernatural, that the most we'd be able to demonstrate is a strong correlation between a particular theistic sect's actions and beliefs and real manifestations of phenomena. I'd say that were that to be the case, you could make a good argument that it would be reasonable to believe that this particular group's actions and beliefs were so strongly correlated with results which were consistent, reliable, and falsifiable, repeatable, that it would be reasonable to have some belief that their foundational beliefs were true. In short, if prayers of Group X were consistently lined up with actual results, there'd definitely be something there worth believing. Perhaps not that a god is answering the prayers, but that the practices could be effective. But that's not the case. Not only has there been no demonstration of that, but repeated tests have demonstrated no such manifestation of phenomena beyond the dictates of chance. When faced with this failure, we often hear, thou shalt not put the Lord thy God to the test. Well, I'm very sorry, but until that situation changes, it simply cannot be reasonable to believe that a God exists. What's worse is that any intelligent God should be well aware of the limitations of our ability to reason and investigate supernatural causes. Any intelligent God who created us and stuck us in this world where we rely on reason and evidence to lead us toward the truth should definitely be aware of this limitation. And any decent God who expects us to reach the conclusion that he exists would have taken steps to alleviate the problem. As the problem is still apparently unresolved, I think we're trending toward the conclusion that no such gods exist, but at a minimum, it simply is not reasonable to believe that a god does exist. Thank you. Hey, uh, I have a mic now. Check, one, two, check. Okay, we're good. Um, Sai will now have 10 minutes for rebuttal. That's all we heard. 10 minutes from somebody who can't know that he's not a brain in the fat. Debates presuppose truth. Matt says truth is that which corresponds to reality. Matt admits he can't know what's real. Everything he says so far is borrowing from my worldview. You can't know anything to be true unless you start with God. Everyone here knows that God exists. Why don't I present evidence? Why don't I present evidence? Where do you hear evidence out in the world? In the court of law. Who do you present evidence to in court? The judge. When you come up to me and say you don't believe in God, and I present you with evidence, I'm saying that you're the judge. You're not the judge. God is the judge. All of you know that he exists. When you come to a debate, you want to hear whether or not what we're arguing is true. You want to know if it's true that God exists. Well, tonight, I'm going to wait to see if Matt ever tells me how he can know anything to be true according to his worldview. Um, Matt did talk about logical absolutes, and we do uh, believe in all logical absolutes. If biochemical reactions are all that you are thinking, then all that you can say is that what you perceive to be logically true and absolute and necessary is nothing more than the result of chemical reactions in your brain. Agreed. Yeah. Matt agrees that his view on logic is a result of the chemical reaction in his brain. I mean, would you come here today and listen to a debate? It was a bottle of Dr. Pepper arguing against a bottle of Mountain Dew. You shake them up and you open them and they start to fizz. Which of those fizzes would be true? Neither. It's just fizz. If Matt's worldview is true, then our, thoughts, our, our brains are just evolved meat machines. And our thoughts 
are the byproduct of the chemical reactions in our evolved brains. It's brain barf. He would be fizzing atheistically, I'm fizzing theistically. And you want to know which one of those is true. You can't get truth from that. You see, Matt's view on logical absolutes, as far as he knows, could be fed to him from a computer when he's a brain in a vat. See, there's not really much more I have to say about that. Yeah, you can laugh all you want. No, I, I'll keep going. I'll just preach to you. Because as long as Matt is up here arguing with me, he's assuming things that he can't make sense with according to his worldview. He talked about law, knowledge and certainty. I didn't bring that up. I brought up truth. Matt assumes truth. You heard him define it. He can't get away from that. See, now, I don't know how the rest of this debate is going to go, whether he's going to talk about alleged contradiction in scripture. I mean, we're going to examine those things according to our presuppositions. I mean, I could stand up here and say, well, um, Matt says that it's always wrong to own humans, which he said on his show a number of times. But then another show, he says that humans are just animals, and Matt owns animals. You know, he even eats animals. I could show the inconsistency there. I could show that inconsistency, but that's not the topic of this debate. It's reasonable to believe that God exists. Reason demands truth, and Matt can't make sense of truth without God. Everyone here knows that God exists, you know, and that's what I'm going to keep telling. And you know what? When I watch Matt's show, I agree with Matt more than I do the callers, the, atheist, uh, the Christian callers that call in. The Christians that call into a show, most of them want to make me puke. I watch the debates he's done. I, I see on YouTube where he's debating this uh, supposed to be some clergyman who denies the authority of scripture. And people put on their mat as finally challenged in the debate. I think it's garbage. It's garbage. I'm glad that we're finally here today. I hope that we do. See, I wanted a free exchange where Matt and I could just talk to each other. And guess what? The debate organizers didn't. I wanted, that's right, you didn't, Sarah. You didn't want that. And I said, well, I know Matt wants that. He doesn't like the formal debate. He wants just an exchange. I said, ask Matt. And they said, no, Matt. He doesn't want that either. He wants us to own the time of the questions. See, because otherwise the bully can take over. The bully can take over and, and then it won't be, you know, nobody will benefit from that. I said, that's Matt's show. The difference is he can't hang up on me here. And I'm glad that we're able to be here and discuss the truth. Just don't forget, don't forget that. Listen to whether or not Matt can show you how he can know anything to be true. He says he could be a brain in a vat. Well, anything he says is boring from my worldview. Anything that he claims to be true, ask him to define it. See where that comes from. And um, well, we'll see how that goes from now. Go on. All right. Matt has 10 minutes for rebuttal. This is going to be close to the 10 minutes. I'd like to start by noting that in a debate, one doesn't normally write their rebuttal ahead of time. Ordinarily, you compose it on the fly as a direct response to what your opponent has said. Tonight, though, I'm breaking from tradition and reading a pre-composed rebuttal. There are a number of problems which philosophers have continually debated and for which there seem to be no solution. I'll take a look at a few of them while I address some of size points. The first issue is the problem of hard solipsism. Essentially, you can't prove that your, the reality you experience is actually real in an ultimate sense. It's been expressed in many ways. One of the more common is that you're a brain in a vat, which in the modern world has been reduced to you could be in the matrix. There are many other ways to express this problem. How do you know you're not imagining a world while locked up in an asylum? And it relates to many other philosophical problems, some of which we're likely to address. The general consensus among philosophers seems to be that there's no current solution to this problem, and that it may be the case that a solution simply isn't possible. I think there are some good arguments against solipsism, but I'll concede, as do most philosophers, that there appears to be no ultimate absolution, absolute solution, but I'm stuck dealing with the reality I experience until someone offers me a way out, and I'm not going to arrogantly and counterproductively assume that you are all figments of my imagination. This problem is also tangled up with some other problems in philosophy, like the apparent inability to achieve absolute certainty in the ultimate sense, and the inability to justify reason. As such, many philosophers have simply acknowledged that they cannot be absolutely certain about anything, including the claim that they cannot be absolutely certain, and that we must begin with some presuppositions which appear to be consistent uniformly true, namely that existence exists irrespective of whether or not it's the ultimate existence, that reason is reliable, and that our experience of reality is generally reliable to the extent that we can even tell when it's not in the case of optical illusions, hallucinations, etc. 
We also tend to agree via Occam's razor that we should minimize the depth of our presuppositions to a level as close to zero as possible. In other words, if we agree that we must first presuppose the laws of logic, then we shouldn't expand this potential problem by presupposing something beyond the laws of logic or something beyond that. Sai and I agree on the logical absolutes, identity, non-contradiction, and excluded middle. We agree they're true. Where we differ is in our definition of truth and in whether or not the question, why are the logical absolutes true, is a coherent question that has an attainable answer. When Sai claims that God serves as a foundation beyond the logical absolutes, when he claims that God is the answer to the question, why are these true, he's violating Occam's razor and his position is less reasonable than if he had merely stopped at the logical absolutes instead of going one step further. When he claims that no other worldview can account for the logical absolutes, he needs to demonstrate the truth of this claim. How did he do this? Has he done it? Van Til and the other presuppositionalists haven't done it. Those are the people from which these ideas have been borrowed, and none of them have demonstrated this case. What they would need to demonstrate is what they claim, that no other worldview, all possible worldviews, fail to account for the logical absolutes except for theirs. How could they prove that? They haven't, they merely claim it. It's worse than that though, because he not only has he not demonstrated that his worldview can account for the absolutes, he's merely asserted that his God has the necessary qualities to do so, which is a vacuous claim. He also hasn't demonstrated that it's even possible to account for the absolutes. Instead, he's claiming found, that he's found something that can because it has the properties that can. And he's made the problem worse by claiming that God is logical as well. If you claim to have solved the Goldbach conjecture and offer nothing more than presuppositions and a solution that you claim is a solution without anything of substance, you're not going to be getting the Fields Medal, you're going to be laughed out of academia. As I've said many times before, the God hypothesis has no explanatory power, and it may just be the case that what Sai is trying to explain actually has no explanation. When he suggests that we must borrow from his worldview, he actually hasn't demonstrated any worldview that is more than a simple assertion that he solved a problem or that his worldview solved a problem. Where is the demonstration of the truth of this? Where is the efficacy of his proposed solution? I don't believe that the question, why are the logical absolutes true, expresses a sensible concept. For me, it's like asking, why is one one? Because it is, and it doesn't appear that it could be another, any other way, and if you think it could be another way, given the evidence to the contrary, you'd need to demonstrate it, and that's a very heavy burden of proof. But if you can do it, I'll believe it. Third, as far as I can tell, we're both stuck in the same world with the same limitations, and yet he's making presumptions that add to the worldview. And I won't say he's borrowing from mine, because what he adds actually makes it a less coherent position. My worldview begins with the recognition of the logical absolutes, that they are true in the foundation of, re of reliable thought, such that we can derive sensible conclusions from them. While I don't support absolute certainty in the ultimate sense upon which Sai's position seems to rest. The logical absolutes represent maximal certainty, which may or may not be absolute, and anything directly deduced from those absolutes, like math and set theory, are also maximally certain, while things indirectly derived from those are reasonable certainties. I can do this in part because I define truth as that which comports with reality, while Sai seems to define truth as that which comports with the mind of God, while offering no reasonable justification for the claim that such a mind exists, let alone a reasonable method for accessing the contents of that mind. The difference in definition means that even if we were to agree that knowledge is justified true belief, we'd still have different def definitions of knowledge because we have different definitions of truth. As my concern is with reality, it's trivial to demonstrate maximal certainty and reasonable certainty based on the foundations of the logical absolutes about which we agree. Aristotle and his band of merry thinkers have already done the work for us by validating all possible syllogistic forms. In the past, I've said that we can be absolutely certain that we exist, that the logical absolutes are true, and about things like esoteric claims and labels, but my expression of absolute certainty on those topics was done within the context of an epistemological view known as foundherentism, which is a combination of foundationalism and coherentism. In a nutshell, within the rules of chess, it is absolutely wrong to move your rock, rook diagonally. And while I reject that we can be absolutely certain from an externalist point of view, we can still be absolutely certain within the meshed framework, and it makes no sense to appeal to some absolute truth in which it isn't wrong to move your rook diagonally. But for the sake of avoiding confusion, fusion, I'll just simply refer to this as maximal certainty and note that maximal certainty may or may not map directly to ultimate certainty. We can't know, or at least it appears that we can't know. What do you know and how do you know it? How do you know anything? How do you know that? These are big questions at the very foundation of epistemology and the answer depends very much on what you mean. I'd like to point out again that what I've been expressing here tonight are beliefs. 
things that I am convinced of and that my goal is for them to be reasonable. Whether or not my beliefs count as knowledge under my definition or size or someone else's is irrelevant to the topic of this debate, and it's largely irrelevant in any context that isn't expressly an academic philosophical discussion about knowledge. As sad as it may be to admit, knowledge appears to be an unresolved and relatively useless label. You can't know anything unless you know everything or know someone who knows everything. Well, I'd like to see the proof of that rather than just an assertion or a demand that we prove them wrong or fallacious shifting the burden of proof. But it completely avoids the question of can you have reasonable beliefs and is this particular belief reasonable? Well, God has revealed things to me in such a way that I can be absolutely certain. Well, please explain this mechanism for us. You're a fallible creature, as far as I can tell, stuck in the same world with the same limitations as the rest of us. Even if we were to grant that there was a perfect God with perfect knowledge, I don't see any demonstration that it's possible for this God to reveal something to you such that you can be absolutely certain. It's like pouring clean water through a dirty filter. You're still going to get dirty water out. In my view, Siam seems to be very strongly convinced that he has an expert he can trust. But how can he know that that expert's knowledge, how can that expert's knowledge make him actually certain? Because that expert can't be wrong? Well, why do you believe that? Because that expert revealed it to you? Well, isn't this the same infinite regress that you're challenging the other people on? Well, no, because God is different and special and the argument is virtuously circular. We'll often hear, although we haven't heard it yet tonight. In the world of logical fallacies, there is no virtuous circle. It's just a way of pretending that you're not engaged in a fallacy when you are. Another clear fallacy here is an appeal to consequences, essentially the starting premise is, without God you can't be absolutely certain or you can't know anything. Well, that's an assertion that neither Sy nor any other presuppositionalist has ever actually defended, as far as I'm aware, and even if it's true, that leaves us with the possibility that we just can't be certain about or know things in the context that they're using the term, which is exactly what modern philosophers tend to say and what I conceded earlier. He claims to be absolutely certain and so, based on his unproven premise in this fallacy, there must be a God. Whose reality do we appeal to for truth? This is the common fallacy of confusing the map for the place. It equates individual perceptions of reality with reality. Whose map of Earth is accurate? Different maps are going to be accurate to different degrees. It's the Earth that is the arbiter of what is correct. There is only reality. The internal maps of reality are secondary. Our goal, by the way, is to construct the most accurate map of reality, as I said during size opening. And it's no solution to assert that you're certain that your map is right. Asserting that God exists and we all know it is not a solution to this problem. It's not a defense of God, it's not an argument, and it's not relevant to this debate or any debate. In order to be reasonable to believe that God exists, we'd need a valid and sound argument supported by evidence, just as we would for any other proposition. It's unreasonable to begin by presupposing the proposition in question. It is unreasonable to believe something merely because it has not been proven wrong. And it's boneheadedly silly to claim that you can't possibly be proved wrong and pretend that that settles the argument. And as to whether or not we can know anything, the only demonstration that I can give is that I wrote this rebuttal ahead of time. <laughs> the next four segments will actually be the discussion portion of the debate, followed by a QA. and uh, So after those, just be thinking about what questions you want to ask. We will be lining up on this side, and I'll be holding this mic right here for you to ask questions. The first conversation is going, the time is controlled by Cy. It will be 10 minutes, and then Matt will have 10 minutes to control the conversation then. Cy, your time begins now. Still. We haven't heard how Matt knows anything to be true. That's a problem. Now, Matt has a definition of truth. Truth is that which corresponds to reality. You know what? I don't have any problem with that definition. But the problem is, according to re truth is that which corresponds to reality, according to who? We all have different perceptions. So one of the, my favorite definition of truth used to be, truth is that which corresponds to reality as perceived by God, as perceived by an absolute perceiver. Because the thing is, we're all going to have different perceptions. But I didn't like that view because I think it adds an unnecessary step. So truth is whatever God says. Truth is whatever conforms to the mind of God. And without that, you can't know anything to be true. And in that Q&A, that's what we're going to find out. But first, I'd like to start off with this question for you, Matt. When you said this. From the standpoint of objective reality, the belief that there is a God is a delusion. Do you still believe that? 
Yes. How do you know anything to be objectively real? How do I know? Any what do you mean by no? Well, the thing is, you made the claim that according to objective reality, belief in God is a delusion. Yes, I'm stating what my belief is, right. not reality. But you said according to objective reality. Yes, I believe it's objective. Okay, so what, how do you know anything to be objectively real when you've admitted you could be a brain and a bat? What do you mean by no? Do you mean how am I aware of? Right, how are you, how are you aware of objective reality? I'm, I'm aware of reality through my senses. But that's not what I asked you. I asked you how you're aware of what is objectively real. Not what you perceive to be real. So when I use the term objectively in this context, I'm, I'm using it in the sense of not subjective or not contingent upon any one mind within the scope of reality. For example, I'm convinced that I'm in a room with other people right now. And if they are, agree with me that I'm in a room with them, then we can then work together to investigate reality. Right. But the, the fact is you've admitted you could be a brain and a fat. I haven't admitted that I can be. I haven't I've you could admitted be. that I cannot prove that I'm not. That's right. So and therefore it follows that you could be. Well, it doesn't follow that you could be. The fact that something hasn't been proved That's to not be what false I'm saying. does not mean that it's possible or true. Okay, so you trust your senses and reasoning in order to determine what is real in your reality. Right? Yes. On what basis do you trust your senses and reasoning? On their continued reliability at producing effective results. Okay, now when you... <laughs> no, see, now the thing is... Hang on, let him ask a question. The, the thing that... <laughs> it never ceases to amaze me that you don't see the folly of that answer. Because the thing is, he said, on their continued reliability. How does Matt know whether they've been reliable in the past? How does Matt know they're reliable now? How does Matt know that they're going to be reliable? Do you know why? Because he uses them to prove it. It's a vicious circle. On what basis do you use, do you trust your sense and reasoning when you determine that they've been reliable? It's not a vicious circle. Um, if you want to know if a pen works, you pick it up and use it. Is it circular to pick it up and use it? If so, then I'll admit that this is circular. Is it, cir is it circular? Is it circular? Is it circular to use your reasoning to justify your reasoning? It's a practical necessity. Is it circular? I told you that at the I said in my uh, rebuttal here that it's a presupposition. Right. I'm not using reason to prove that reason is valid. I'm using reason because it continues to produce effective results. Do you use your reasoning in determining that? Yes. Well, then you're using your reasoning to prove your reasoning. Which isn't a problem <laughs> as long as it's continuing to produce effective okay. results. Okay. Let, let me put it this way. Not, oh, I'm sorry. It's your question. Let me put it this way. If your reasoning was not valid, how could you know it? I don't know. You don't know. See, that's the problem. See, because he says he's using, he's using his reasoning to prove his reasoning. Well, if it wasn't valid, he could never know it. Well, I didn't say I couldn't ever know I'm it. I'm saying you couldn't know. You said you don't oh, know. Okay. I'm saying you couldn't know it. Good. Can because you if your reasoning, if it wasn't valid, on what basis could you know that it, was, that it was valid? You couldn't. It would be invalid. How do you know your reasoning is not invalid, Matt? Well, see, reasoning isn't one thing, first of all. It's not like we just reason and it's all there. It's, it's, you, know, you might reason correctly at one instance, you might reason incorrectly at another instance, but that's me using reason, which is separate from reason, which is the foundations, the logical absolutes, which continue to be true. How do you know that your cognitive faculties by which you determine things to be true are functioning properly? Well, I test them. By, by, by using them. By using them. Now, if they were not functioning properly, how could you know it? I'd probably be dead. <laughs> See, now, now that's a fallacy of irrelevant theses. A lot of people don't realize that. But the thing is, let's say I went to a plane crash. I was, I was a reporter hired to cover a plane crash. And I go to that plane crash, and I say, how is it possible you survived this plane crash? And if he said, he said I, if, if I didn't survive it, I couldn't be here talking to you. That's exactly what Matt did here. I'm asking how he knows that his sense and reasoning are, are reliable. He says, well, I'd probably be dead. That's like me going to that plane crash and saying, how did you survive this crash? He said, if I didn't, I wouldn't be here talking with you. And it would be true. Uh -huh. It'd be true, but it'd be irrelevant, sir. It would be irrelevant. It's a fallacy of irrelevant thesis. Sure, he wouldn't be here. I agree with that. But I'm asking how he knows that they're valid. You can't know. You couldn't know if they were valid or not. What do you You're mean appealing? by no? I'm not saying that I know. I'm saying I believe them to be valid and that I believe that this belief is reasonable because of their continued But effectiveness. you could be wrong. I haven't claimed to know. But you could be wrong. I, I, have not, I have no reason to think that I'm wrong, but I cannot demonstrate that it's impossible that I'm wrong. That doesn't mean that I could be <laughs> okay, wrong. Okay, how about this? Why don't you tell me one thing you know? Why? Because that's my question, sir. Well, what do you mean by no? Justified true belief. I'm not claiming to know. You'd anything. 
what, what, what do I consider as justified true belief? I, am, I believe that, uh, well, in that context, justified true belief, are we using my definition of true or yours? Yours. What do you know to be true? What do you sure, know that I know corresponds? I'm not omniscient in that context. Do you know that corresponds with absolute reality? Do you know that? No. Okay, well, that's fine. I asked him one thing, and he doesn't even know the one thing he claims to know. What? what? That's the problem. That's a problem. Sorry. Uh, you see, I don't mind. You know, I was the one who wanted a free exchange. <laughs> I did. I'll show you the emails. I'm going to post them later. I wanted a free exchange. Yeah, and you should she stop didn't, blaming and Sarah you because I didn't. No, but she started it, though. Yeah. And then you... <laughs> she did. Unless you are, unless you are preparing, unless you are preparing this debate, you know, uh, preparing the the the, uh, the standard for this debate, you know, without my knowledge of it, that that might have been the case behind the scenes. That's fine. I expect that. But but that isn't the point. I mean, the fact is, I want to know how you can know anything to be true, and you have to dodge. Like the thing is, when I ask you how do you know something, if you don't answer that to anybody else, a cop comes up to you, you know, and they ask you how you know something, you don't say, what do you mean by no officer? I mean, you only have to play these philosophical mumbo-jumbo games with a Christian to avoid the God that all of you know exists. Sure, you can laugh if you want, but it's absurd. It's absurd. Okay, uh, let me ask you this question. Um, if you remove right. every mind from the universe, yeah. a rock is still a rock. You said if you remove every mind from the universe, a rock is still a rock. Yes. How do you know that? I didn't say that I knew it, did I? So what kind of a claim is it then? It's a belief claim. I am convinced that that's true and that it's reasonable. So you're saying a rock is still a rock. You're not saying you believe it. I'm expressing a belief. I don't recall using the word no, nor do I ever use it in your context of appealing to absolute reality, which is why I don't use the philosophical mumbo jumbo with a cop, but I do with somebody who's going to try to say that anything is a claim to knowledge and anything is an appeal to an absolute reality when that is not what I'm appealing to at all. Okay, what is your evidence then that a rock is still a rock? The evidence that a rock is still a rock is that the rock is currently a rock. Yeah, right. right. Okay. But I'm saying you said... And, 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 that, and that there is no... There is no demonstrated effect of removing minds from the universe that would result in a rock ceasing to be what it is. It is consistent with the laws of logic that identity remains. The rock is a rock is a rock. That is the foundation. It's the, the logical absolutes of the presupposition that I agreed upon. That is the foundation upon which I determine what beliefs are justified and reasonable. So what is your evidence that a rock is a rock, even if there's no mind? What's your evidence of that? Because a rock is a rock now? There are minds now. What is your evidence that a rock will be a rock if there's no minds? I think I just told you. Well, you didn't. I mean, you could, uh, you could, you could reply. You could, uh... I, I, can, I could say it again in a different way if you'd like. Sure. What is your evidence that a the, rock is still a rock without any minds? The evidence is that there is no, causal, there is no demonstrated connection that a rock would change what it is. It's like uh, the tree falling in the, in the forest type thing. Um, would, you, would you agree with me that uh, the rock that nobody has looked at on Fifth and, and Park uh, that's in the gutter is actually a rock even if nobody's looking at it? Well, it's my time to ask questions, but I want you to... In simple terms, argument from ignorance just means X is true because X has not been proved false. X seconds. is true because... X has not been proved false. That's exactly what you said. Yes. About a rock being a rock. Not. That's an argument from ignorance. No, it's not. Right out of your mouth. It's not. Sure it is. Okay. You have 20, you have 20 seconds. Sorry. No, that's fine. <laughs> I concede my 20 seconds. I, you can have it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Matt now owns the next 10 minutes of the conversation. So you're not an evidentialist anymore, even though... Once upon a time, you were. Um, I would say that I'm the ultimate evidentialist. I would say all evidence points to the existence of God. A presuppositionalist is the ultimate evidentialist. I don't say special evidences point to God. I say that you can't make sense of any evidence unless you start with God. But you don't present evidence in any defense of God anymore because... I present evidence when I share my faith. I go for a walk, I look up at the stars, and I actually laugh that there's people out there who look at the sky and deny that God exists. I present evidence when I share my faith. But when somebody says you're nuts for what you believe, then I don't put them in the judge's seat and God on trial. Okay. Um, in the past, and, and I apologize for bringing up the past because we haven't spoken much, and so you'll have every opportunity to correct this, but um, you've said that God reveals things to you in such a way that you can be certain. To everybody. Well, for now, we'll just stick with you. 
Well, I say he reveals things to everyone such that they can know. Uh, I understand history. that. That's what I say. Yes. How does that work? That, you know, that would be a very good question if you could know that you were in a brain in a vat. Ah. So there, you're not going to answer the question. No, I would say it's irrelevant. Your question presupposes that it's happened. Uh, whether, what, what my question presupposes is irrelevant to whether or not you're willing to answer and give the explanation that no presuppositionalist has ever done, which is how is it possible for God to reveal things to you in such a way that you can be certain? Because he's God. God can do that. Oh, okay. Um, hang on. No, 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 no. Now, you said that... Are you saying God can't do that? You've said, now first of all, uh, well, uh, we'll get to those questions in a minute. You've said that you believe that we all already know God exists. That's right. And, and you're convinced that this is true. It's well, not, not whether I'm convinced or not, it is true. Okay, and you, it's absolutely impossible for you to be wrong about that. About that, yes. Okay. So what about the Paraha, the tribe that has no God concept, um, who has no... Well, they didn't have numbers and any other things, but they didn't have any God concept. And when the missionaries went down there, um, they were baffled by this, that they had no appeal to super. That's a great question, because if I ask people in this audience, you say, you have no God concept either. Why did Christians send missionaries to them, though? You see, because if they did well, not know, know that this hang on, anything to, if no, no, they no, didn't it's know. my time for questions. Okay. And if you get derailed, I want to know, what about the Paraha? What about them? They know that God exists. Even though they have no concept, no language, no nothing. I deny that. When presented with the concept. I deny that. That's why we send missionaries. Because if they didn't know that God exists, sending missionaries would be the worst thing we could do. So we you send missionaries. You deny what the sociologists who went down there, who studied them and reported back, have to say. Exactly. Okay, fine. What about babies? What about them? Do they know that God exists? Yes, they do. Uh, how can that be the case when we know that babies develop a theory of mind over time? How is it possible that they can know that, some, uh, that God exists when they cannot, and there's no demonstration that they can be aware that there are other minds until some period of time has passed? Well, you're telling me something you know now. Is this what you believe or is it what you know? What difference does it make? I asked a question. Well, you believe it. You believe that that's the I case. I don't believe that that's, that's the case. I believe that that's the case because that's where the evidence points. Evidence, okay. evidence presupposes truth. Truth presupposes God. Okay. Um, so, God makes it so that we all know he exists. Right. What do you mean by know? Do you mean just that we're aware of that God exists or that we... You have sufficient knowledge of God for your condemnation. Okay. Everyone. That's why we send missionaries. How can someone know something and yet not be aware of it? Well, I say they are aware of it, but they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. As this is well, if you suppress one. it, then... Well, how is it that somebody could know that God exists and be aware of it and yet be convinced that they not only do they not know it, but they don't believe it. Well, it depends to the degree that they suppress it, because God hands them over to it. Because I went to the atheistic reason rally a couple years back, and the guys, you know, high school age, college age, I could reason with them. The guys that were 40, 50 with their tight ponytail, you know, the greasy ponytail coming out, they were just giving me the finger. They wouldn't talk to me. God hands them over to it. Are they more convinced that there is no God? You know, I don't doubt it. But God hands them over to their suppression of the truth, and that's why I urge you. I urge you in this well, audience to repent has, before it's My ponytail is pulled so tight that it eventually fell off. But, <laughs> uh, but, but I, am, I, I am a 40-something, and while I won't give you the finger here, we'll, we'll hold off for later. Why would, if, if God can reveal the truth that he exists to everybody, why would he leave the most important message? I'm assuming that the gospel message is more important. I mean, it's the gateway to salvation, supposedly? Why would he leave the most important message prone to mistakes from poor apologists, scribal errors, and the limitations of reason, rather than directly revealing that to everyone? For a reason which is perfectly sufficient for God. <laughs> okay. So, if, um, if, if God made you certain that you're correct about all this, what do we tell the other Christians who also think that God made them certain, yet they disagree with you on points of doctrine? Well, I would ask them if Scripture is their ultimate authority. If it was, then I would do a Bible study with them, and I would show them in Scripture. See, I'm not, a, I'm not beyond correction, but Scripture is my ultimate authority, and therefore that is where the argument lies. Okay. And so it's because Romans 1 says that everybody knows. You, right. Yeah. Um, and it says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. Yes, I'm aware of that. Right. What, what does that mean, by the way? Well, actually, you know what? I just heard recently that the hero is, the fool says in his heart, no God for me. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, so you believe that God reveals to all of us in ways that we can all be certain? Everyone is certain. Not can be certain, is certain. Okay. That's why they're without excuse. Why wouldn't that mean that God revealed to me the fallacies in your argument and the objections to your position, which would raise a contradiction? 
Well, because fallacies assume that God has revealed himself to you, because you appeal to logical absolutes which you can't make sense of without God. That's what you say, but that's not what I say. Well, the thing is, you can't know you're not a brain in a vat. You've seen I, that. I didn't you say that. that. Yes, you did. I have video of you I saying said that. I can't demonstrate. You said you, said you no could be reason. a solipsist. Yes, and so the, the, the issue with solipsism is that there are solipsists who assert that we are in fact that they are in fact the only mind, and there are others who just recognize the demo that we cannot demonstrate that we're not. So let me ask you this. If something hasn't been demonstrated to be impossible, is it then possible? No. I, well, it hasn't demonstrated to be impossible? If you haven't demonstrated that it's impossible, does that mean that it's possible? No, I wouldn't say so. Okay. And if something hasn't been demonstrated to be false, then that, is it then true? No, I wouldn't say so. Great. So then why is it that when we talk about this, and I honestly recognize that I can't demonstrate that I'm not a brain in a vat, you keep coming back with, I can't know that I'm not a brain in a vat, or that I could be a brain in a vat, neither of which have I said or conceded. Well, when you say that actually I'm kind of a solipsist, you did yes. concede it. No, because no, no. The thing is, I just gave you the explanation for the different forms of solipsism. When I said I'm kind of a solipsist, I'm talking about the solipsist that recognizes that I can't prove hard solipsism is false. I'm not saying I'm kind of the guy who believes that I am the only mind. Otherwise, why the hell would I engage anybody in conversations? Well, the problem is that you believe in log logical absolutes and your finite mind cannot know an absolute. It's impossible. I haven't claimed to know an absolute. I've claimed to believe that they're true and they can seem to be consistently true and you agree. But they could be false. Could they? Well, that's my question to you. If, well, what is your justification? I haven't said that they could be false. I've just said, as I just asked, if something hasn't been demonstrated to be false, is it then right. true? Well, that's why I'm asking and the question. if something hasn't been demonstrated to be true, then is it false? No. Right. So it's, it may not be the case that they're false, and it may not be the case that it's possible that they're false. What's your question? Isn't that correct? I, I don't hear that. What's the question? All right. When you're trying to convince someone, how much time I got left? Two minutes. Oh, okay. When you're trying to convince someone of something about which you disagree, isn't it wise to start where you do agree and work from there? Um, I would say in many situations, but Jesus Christ said there is no neutrality. You're either for me or against me. There is no neutrality in this, in this instance. If I, assume, if I assume neutrality, I'm denying what Scripture says. So if we're going to go about trying to be reasonable, why isn't what you just said a case of special pleading? Because this is about something that Scripture has revealed that all of you know. And if I, if I go to a neutral position, I say, well, let's put God on the shelf. Let's see if we can argue to the existence of God. I'm denying what Scripture says. It says, do not answer the fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. But that doesn't answer my question of sure. why that's not special pleading. All you did was demonstrate that it is special pleading. What's wrong with special pleading in your worldviews? It's a fallacy. It's a logical fallacy? Yes. Do you believe that or is that true? I believe it. But it's not necessarily true, right? Well, it's true in the sense of my definition of being consistent with reality. In reality, it's a fallacy. Which reality? Yours or mine? Well, it seems to be the one we agree on. Don't you think it's a fallacy? I have not. I, did, I missed the meeting, Matt. When did we agree on that, on that reality? I'm asking you now. I have a reality where God exists. When was the meeting? I'm not evidently in that reality, but I'm asking you now. Don't you, you believe that, that that's a fallacy? I can account for logical fallacies. I'm it asking doesn't how you matter whether you think you can account for logical fallacies. Don't you believe that that's a no, fallacy? No, I don't. Okay. If you don't believe it's a fallacy... Why is special pleading not a fallacy? And why is it considered to be a fallacy by every expert? Well, the thing is, is that according to my reality or according to your reality? P take your pick. According, I, I to my like reality, according to my reality, it's not special pleading. Well, that's not my question. According to your reality, is special pleading a fallacy? Yes, it can be. You just mm -hmm. said you believed that you didn't believe it that is. it was. Well, I don't believe that what you said was special pleading. No, I actually believe. Okay, yes, it's a fallacy. Right. I believe it's a fallacy. So yes. now we spend all this time to get to the point that what we really disagree on is whether what you said is special pleading. Right. And by definition, I'd say that special pleading is when you say that we're going to use reason and the standards of reason in every case, but this one is special because it's God. No, that, that's not. The, that's a different situation. Time. Okay. See, because everyone knows that, that God that exists. Time. That's, that's time. <laughs> Please. All right, we have two more segments, one with Sai, one with Matt, and then your questions will begin. So be thinking about what you want to ask. Sai, your 10 minutes begins now. I would say that, first of all, to get back to that point, 
fallacies, even in, in you've said too that argument from authority is a logical fallacy, I admit that. However, it's not always a logical fallacy because you have said that yourself, it's not a fallacy if you're appealing to the actual authority. Yes. Right, so there are instances when something is a logical fallacy and sometimes it isn't. Is that special pleading? Well, those start the same things. Is it special pleading to say that an argument from authority is sometimes a fallacy and sometimes it's not a fallacy? Argument from authority is always a fallacy. The fallacy is defined as appealing to an authority that is not an authority. So when you appeal to authority, then it's not an argument from... Uh, if you simply cite an authority, that's not necessarily an appeal to authority fallacy. The name of the fallacy is appeal to authority. The definition of the fallacy is appealing to author an authority who is not an authority. And who gets to determine whether or not that's an authority? We do. We do. Who's yeah. we? Well, normally... Because everybody, when they appeal to authority, will say, well, this is an authority. Yes, what you do is you present the credentials, and you demonstrate that the person, first of all, exists, and then you demonstrate that they are actually an expert in the field. And then after, and then after presenting their credentials, the individual gets to determine whether or not they're going to recognize that that person is authority. You can reject whatever authority you want. Okay, when you said, um, Matt, that... Um, it, you, can never conform, you can never confirm supernatural causation. Yes. What's your evidence of that? We are blocked from confirming supernatural causation. I actually presented it, the, the reasons behind it. And that is that there is no demonstrated mechanism for linking supernatural causes to, to natural uh, manifesting phenomena. That's just an argument. I want the evidence. What's the evidence? What's the evidence? Yeah, that you can't prove supernatural causation. What's the evidence of that? Well, the position is actually that we cannot yet demonstrate supernatural causation. And what's and your evidence? The evidence, evidence yeah. is that we have not yet. That's an argument from ignorance. No, it's not, sure because it I'm not asserting that it's necessarily impossible for us to ever, which is why I put maybe in what I was talking about, that maybe it's the case that we'll never be able to demonstrate supernatural causation. All we can say is that so far, no one has demonstrated that it is possible to demonstrate. Now, is that true or do you just believe that? Both. <laughs> so it is true. It's consistent with reality, which is my definition of truth. Okay, which reality, Matt? Reality. Whose reality? Well, as I talked about in my uh, rebuttal, which I wrote ahead of time, um, it's you're, you're confusing the map for the place. When you say who's reality, nobody's. It's not any individual's perception of reality. It is reality. So if you and I are sitting here, and evidently we can't agree, but if we could agree that we are in a shared reality, then reality are those things that we agree upon, that we can demonstrate reliably. But at a core level, because we can't demonstrate that we're not a brain and a bat, reality is the reality I experience. I just happen to be convinced and believe for what I think are good reasons, that I'm sharing it with all these other people. Right, but you have no basis for knowing that, though. Well, I didn't say I knew it, did I? See, I don't even know what you mean by knowing. That's the absurdity of this. It's absolutely absurd to engage with somebody who wants to have a debate about truth, and you ask him how he knows something to be true, and he says, well, I don't claim to know anything to be true. It's absurd. Why is it absurd to recognize, honestly, the limitations of that which has not yet been proved? Because every word out of your mouth betrays your position. Because here's my question, Matt. You're about to utter sounds into the ether. You're about to formulate words, and you're about to speak them out here. On what basis do you assume that those words mean the same thing they did five seconds ago? What makes you think I'm going to utter sounds into the ether? You just did. How do you know? I just heard you. How do you know? Well, my question is my turn to ask questions. <laughs> No, no. It's it, my turn to ask questions. On point. what basis do you assume that the sounds you're about to make mean the same thing they did five seconds ago? Well, first of all, the sounds don't have meaning. Words you're, don't have meanings. They have usages. We share an understanding of a word. And so when I express something, the, this, this communication with other people is something that is very difficult. In many cases, we use words in different ways. And so I know that what I'm express I know what I'm expressing, whether or not the individual I'm speaking to is going to have the same understanding. I don't know that absolutely certain, but I know it's a pretty good confidence within the realm of reality. On what basis do you assume that you're a sound okay, let me put it this way. You're assuming the future is going to be like the past. 
Yes. Generally on what basis speaking, do you do that? On what basis do you do that? Generally, it, okay, we live our lives by inference and induction. We right. are under the general assumption that the future is going to be pretty much like the past, not exactly like the past, and that is because we have this trend of that always happening. <laughs> so the future will be like the past because the future has been like the past in the past. Well, yes, as long as you're not claiming That's that a logical fallacy. No, it's not because I'm not asserting that there is absolutely no difference in the future. I'm, de I'm saying that my position is that I believe, and I believe that I am rationally justified in believing, that the future is going to be pretty much like the past. So if I said to you, you've just proven I'm never going to die because I've never died in the past, would that not be a logical fallacy? No, because we have, know that people die. Yeah, but you know what? I'm a lot like those other people except for one thing. I've never died. And that's true for everybody right up until the point they have. So, <laughs> therefore... That being the case, on what basis do you assume that the future will be like the past? I assume that in the future you will die. <laughs> That's not my question. If I, if I drive past a thousand red houses, okay. and somebody asks me what color is the next house going to be, okay. how can you answer that question? You don't know what the next house is going to okay, be. Okay, but that's but exactly your argument when you no, say the future is going to be like the past because of the past. No, it's not, because the question is different. If you were to say, based Special on... Special pleading. No. Based on... Go ahead. It's good. It's fair. Based on the houses that you've seen, what would you predict the next house is going to be? That's the world we live in, a world where we are making predictions based on probabilities from our experience of the past. We are not declaring that we have tuned into the absolute reality and have divine revelation that the next house is going to be read and that we can't be wrong about that. It is, it is called inference and induction for, well, there's a difference between induction and deduction. And induction is this process by which we make predictions about the future. Right. We are not making claims that we are certain or that it couldn't be different. We well, make predictions. I'm going to bring it right down to the level that hopefully I, the most people can understand. Inductive reasoning is, I'm going to call it looking back at reasoning. Looking back at to prove future events. Mm. Okay, so looking back at reasoning. So my question to you is, how do you know that looking back at reasoning is valid? And what do you do? You look back. I You're don't understand your question. And maybe I made it too simple. Probably. <laughs> Inductive reasoning is looking back at reasoning. That's what I'm going to call it. It's looking back to prove future events. So when yeah. I say prove that inductive reasoning is valid, what do you do? You look back. Now, You're whole, using it to prove it. And that's point, a vicious circle. So the whole point about inductive reasoning is that you can't prove that it's valid. See, this is, when exactly. I talked about, this is when I talked about the logical absolutes and them being maximally certain, and those things which are directly derived from them are also maximally certain. Those, that is deductive reasoning, things like mathematics and, and set theory. Inductive reasoning is something that you cannot demonstrate that is necessarily true. Is logic absolute? Do I believe that logic is no, absolute? No, I'm asking you, is logic absolute? Define logic. Because are you talking about the logical absolutes that we talked about, the laws of identity, non -conscious? Yes. Do are I they absolute? I believe that they're absolute. So you, are they absolute? That's my question. I need, are you, are you asking me if I'm absolutely certain that they're absolute? I'm asking you if they're absolute. You're asking me if they're absolute. Right. I don't know. So do they necessarily apply to this uh, debate? Yes. Based on what standard? I believe that they apply to this debate. They necessarily, or do you believe it, or do they necessarily apply, apply to this debate? Well, I, I can't, since I can't say for absolute certain that they're, they're there, or that, that I cannot, see, this is a problem with, with when you start going down these where you're smuggling in absolute certainty without actually saying it. Because. Are you absolutely certain of that? No. Because I've already conceded at the beginning that I'm not saying I'm absolutely certain about anything. I Are you absolutely not, certain that you're not absolutely certain about anything? No, I'm maximally certain. Maximally certain. Which is what I've started off with. Is that a problem, that we're not absolutely certain? Oh, it's your, your question. You said Sorry. logical absolutes exist in all possible worlds. Yes. How do you know that? Uh, not only do I not know that. Uh, so you don't know anything you claim? Well, I'm saying that I believe it, which is what so I said. So you don't know anything? What I said. I Does knowledge have to be true? Here's, yes, we, we, okay. I define knowledge in a specific way, and I pointed out that because we have a different definition of truth, we're going to have different understandings of knowledge. So under my definition of knowledge, do I know it? Yes. But under right. yours, do I know it? Okay. I don't think so. Under your definition of knowledge, you know it. So you know it cor uh, corresponds with reality. 
With ultimate reality or what you perceive to be real? With the reality that I perceive. I don't know that that's not ultimate reality. I don't know anything about ultimate reality. That's a nonsensical term. It, all, it's a nonsensical term. Can, until you somebody it. demonstrates that there's some reality other than the reality I experience, it's nonsensical. Yeah, but you could be a brain in a vat saying that very thing. And until you demonstrate that that's the case, I have no good reason to think it's true, and I'm still stuck dealing no with No good reason reality. to think it's true, you assume that you're not. When you say no good reason to think it's true, you're assuming that you're not a brain of that. You, you're assuming that you've solved solipsism. No, I'm not so assuming sure you that I've solved it all. This is why I asked you the question before about whether or not something has been proved false, does that mean it's true? I'm acknowledging that I cannot confirm that I'm not a brain in a vat, right. but irrespective of whether I can confirm that I'm not a brain in a vat, I have no good reason to think I am, and I am stuck dealing with the reality that I experience where it appears that I'm not a brain you in a vat. You said that you cannot solve solipsism. You have no answer to hard solipsism. You've said that. But when you assume that there is no answer to hard solipsism, you're assuming that it's been solved. No, I'm not. Sure yeah. you are, well, because you're reasoning outside of your own brain. Is, I don't know why this is so difficult for you to understand. That's the time. But when I, oh, sorry. Well, it's my turn. Yeah, now it's your turn. <laughs> now it's your turn, Matt. You have 10 minutes. Um, as, you, as you have questions, start lining up over here at the end of Matt's segment. Uh, we will be doing the Q&A. And I'm not gonna take the whole 10 minutes, probably. Go ahead. So, um, there was something you said a minute ago that I, I had previously said about the logical absolutes. And the reason I mentioned that is uh, because I cleared that up in my rebuttal when I said that in the past I've talked about them being absolute and that we can be absolutely certain of those. And I'm speaking in ab when I said absolute certainty within the, when the, within the epistemological foundations excuse me, of found herentism. Now, the problem here is, is a big disconnect, and it's the reason why you find it frustrating and why I find it frustrating. I'm not frustrated, I expect it. Sorry. It's the reason, see, I couldn't have predicted that. Because <laughs> everybody else is frustrated. I'm not frustrated. <laughs> and the, the, the reason, it must be so comfortable to, to just not, not have that sort of frustration. So. When I say that I don't have a solution to hard solipsism, that doesn't mean that, I've con that I believe that hard solipsism is false or that I've proved that it's false or that I'm assuming that it's false. There is, a, there is in any situation this establishment of the burden of proof that you do not believe something until such time as it's been demonstrated to be true or likely true. Do you accept that? Well, here's the problem, Matt. When you say there's a burden of proof, you're assuming that solipsism has been solved. No, I'm not. Sure you are. Because is it true that I have a burden of proof? It, that or is, do you just that, believe it? That is irrelevant. But you see, the thing is, is that you seem to only be able to see this from your worldview. You cannot. Of course. You cannot, so do you. No, I can, I can. See, I can put on your worldview hypothetically in order to address something. You seem incapable of putting on mine for a moment to address something. And what I've said from the very beginning, and I could go back and read it, is I defined what I meant by truth. I acknowledge the presuppositions and that what I mean by truth is that which conforms with reality, which is predicated on the foundation of the logical absolutes. And so when I say I believe something or I know something, that is the logical absolutes are the foundation upon which it rests. But you and can't you, account for logical absolutes. That's a problem. And you keep coming back, as you just did, with you can't account for logical absolutes. Right. Well, I hate to tell you this, but neither can you. All you can do is claim that you can account for the logical absolutes. Please account for the logical absolutes. That is the two quote fallacy, two quote way, to say, I can't, but either can you. No, no, no. I'm asking how you account for them. It would how be, do I account for it them? It would be a fallacy. I'd be happy to add. It would be a fallacy. You if, too is the two, two quote way fallacy. It, it would be a fallacy if I was asserting that you were wrong. I'm asking no, no, no. you, yes. I'm asking you to demonstrate that you are right. I, no, the thing is, you're saying that I can account for logical absence, but either can you. No, That's a two you are asserting about. that no one but you can account, no one can account for logical absolutes except for within your worldview, and I'm asking you to demonstrate that that's true. Well, I have no problem doing that. Logical absolutes reflect the thinking of God. What? They reflect the thinking of God. I'm done with my questions. We can go to the audience. Now nah, we're good. By his revelation, the same way you do. See, because we all appeal to logical absolutes. I, I'm done with my logical question. Logical absolutes. Time. Oh, I, I'm not done with my answer. Yes, you are. It's my time, and I cut No, off. I can answer. <laughs> no. Time belongs to me. Right. 
but you're done, and so I can answer. The question time belongs to me, and I just put it at an end. Do you and know the what he's doing? In the order, he's hanging up the on audience me. questions, and I swear if he's you, hanging up on me. That's you what bet your ass, because right. you said I couldn't. <laughs> Yeah, I thought he wouldn't do it here, but he's trying to hang up on me here, too. He just put you on hold. Yeah, same thing. Okay, be sure to speak up when you ask your question. Please keep your question short. Don't ramble and give a bunch of opinions. I'll cut you off. I promise I don't mind being rude. Um, and I'm going to stand up here so that we're mostly the same size. <laughs> the time starts now. This will last 35 minutes. Please... Uh, State exactly who your question is going to be to. I'll hold the mic. <laughs> my, question, my question is for Cy. Cy, your first premise is flawed. The uh, premise says that it is reasonable to believe what is true, but that glosses over whether our minds can know that something is true. If a blind person is told that a painting is by Van Gogh, that is a true statement. It may be reasonable to believe it, but the blind person cannot know it. Similarly, if we are talking about God, we are talking about someone who is qualitatively over, above, beyond, anterior to everything else that exists. There is no possible way that any of us, with our limitations of three dimensions of space and one of time, could possibly know such a thing, whether it happened to be true or not, any more This is why I wanted the questions written down, by the more, way. Any more than... <laughs> Yes, any, uh, any more than a goldfish in its bowl, seeing me standing in the living room, could tell whether I was also suspended in water as it was. What's your answer? I didn't hear a question. Do you have a specific question for Sai? Yes. Yes. How, uh, yes. How, how can it be reasonable to claim that it, to, to know something when our very minds are so framed that whether or not something is true, we could not possibly perceive it or authenticate it. It could not be. I, I disagree with your premise, sir. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm saying that Thank we can know things Thank for you. certain as God reveals them. And I, I think it's, uh, I'm really surprised that you disagree with the first premise that it's reasonable to believe that th things which are true. I find that, that remarkable. But. Right. Who's your question for? Uh, my question's for Sai, <laughs> of course. Uh, I have a little problem understanding your position, so I have a quick, simple question for you. Sure. Do you believe that democracy is the best system in a civilized society? No, actually. I believe theocracy is. Theocracy. Yes. Ooh. Christian theocracy. <laughs> All right. Okay. Who's your question for? It's for Sai. Um, Sai, how can you trust the Christian God? Your Bible has him lying from Genesis chapter 2 and stating that humans will die if they eat the fruit, yet they, meaning Adam and Eve, actually lived for hundreds of years after eating said fruit. Well, I don't normally do uh, Bible studies with professed atheists, but that's a misreading of the text. They did die that day. They died spiritually. <laughs> In a completely imperceptible way. Who's your question for? <laughs> uh, going back to what you quote as a scriptural authority. Right. Uh, we've got things that you can go out and verify that is being wrong. Like Jesus saying, the mustard seed is smallest in all the world. Now, you yourself can verify under your God's worldview that historically, <laughs> We have documentation that they used poppy seeds, which you can check as being smaller. <laughs> I mean, how do you consolidate that? I mean, are you not being like deceived I say, I, I don't by do the Bible spirit of deception, no. as Paul writes? I don't do Bible studies with, with uh, non-believers. See, the thing is, as, as a Christian, I'll seek... No, but no, he wouldn't. Guys, please, hold on. No, man. If, you, if you're going to ask... If you're going to ask questions from the audience, if you're going to ask questions from the audience, I'll, I'll answer that. Jesus would not put his word up to the authority of you to judge whether it's true or not. I'll proclaim, 
I will proclaim, I will proclaim the truth of Scripture to you, but I will not discuss the truth of it with you. Sai, Sai, are you okay. saying that you will not answer any questions regarding the Bible from an not, atheist? Not, not when an atheist says, well, it's false because of this, because I don't believe with their presuppositions. I will not put the Word of God up to the, the test of the atheist. I don't, I don't hear anybody you saying it's... I don't believe in atheists. I, I'm... <laughs> Okay, hold on. Okay, well, when I say atheist, when I say atheist, I mean professed atheist. I'm an atheist. I I got to stop here for for a couple things, and and hopefully you'll forgive me this interruption. Um, Because number one, I don't hear anybody saying it's false because what they were asking was, this is a an issue that would seem to contradict itself, and they were looking for an explanation. But you answer whatever. But if it would be possible, if we could divide the line up between people who have questions for Sai and people who have questions for me. So I was actually about to ask them to raise their hands. And also, while I appreciate everybody's enthusiasm, we have a line of questions for a reason. Uh, and if everybody from the audience is going to start shouting questions and comments, which some of them I love, but uh, <laughs> I'm not going to get to talk, and I'm an egomaniac who needs to talk sometime in the next two minutes. <laughs> so. Yeah, please line up if you have a question. Uh, who's your question for? Mine's for Sai also. Hey. <laughs> okay, so Tried. do you feel that you or I are qualified to question the Word of God? To question it? To disagree with the Word of God. No. So, so Scripture, you would say, is, is where knowledge begins. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Okay, All the treasures so, of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Jesus Christ. That's okay, right. so you should not question Scripture, right? Not the truth of it. Okay. So can I read a scripture to you? No, I don't do Bible studies with atheists. I can't even read one? Do you believe it's true what you're reading? Do you believe what you're reading is true, sir? I'd actually like to know if you think this is true. I think the whole Bible is true. And this I will reconcile it according to my presuppositions. I'll this, seek to reconcile that. But I don't do Bible studies with atheists. Okay, then I promise I'm not going to read you a Bible verse. Okay. They said and boast, we killed Christ... Jesus, the son of Mary, but they killed him not, nor crucified him. It's from the but Quran. so it was made, huh? From the Quran. Correct. Do you agree with that? No. But that's God's word. No, it's not. But yes, it is. It's Are you the a Quran. Muslim? Are, Are you, you a Muslim? Well, am I supposed You're to. You're saying that's the word of God. Are you a right. Muslim? Well, are you saying it's not the word of God? I am saying it's not How the word of God. How do you know? How do I know that, the, that what the Quran says is not the word of God? If you want me to go through that refutation, I'll be happy to. What does the Quran say about the Bible? That's my question to you. What does the Quran say about the Bible? Do you it's have any idea? Okay. It says it's a previous revelation of God, and it says that it's true. It says to believe it. And I'll ask the Muslim, why do you not believe the, the Bible today? And you know what the Muslim will say? Because it's been corrupted. And then I'll ask the Muslim, what does your Quran say about whether the words of Allah can be corrupted? And I'll say, it cannot. See, that's the problem. If the Quran is true, the Bible is true. And because the Bible is true, the Quran is false. Does anybody have a question for Matt over here? Raise your hand. Come on up. Hey. I already like yeah, you. I'm, I'm going to use words, even though apparently they don't have meaning. So uh... <laughs> They don't. My question is, it seems like what you've provided thus far is what philosophers would call an internalist theory of justification. And if you're providing an internalist theory of justification, you're also using uh, statements like, uh, degrees of certainty, or when you say things like maximal certainty, you're talking about a degree. I, first of all, I don't know what a what a found. I don't know what a foundational unit of certainty would look like. But secondly, that seems to place uh, rationality on um, personal emotional disposition. So, are you saying that God isn't true because you have a personal, or I'm sorry, that God isn't, or belief in God is not reasonable because you have a strong personal disposition against that? Thank you. No, I have no personal disposition against belief in God. I I have a personal disposition that is for evaluation of evidence and reason. And so, uh, you know, while I can say that I know God exists, um, until there's a demonstration that is based on evidence, um, it's it's one of those things where if somebody tells you that you know something and this is just foreign to me, how can I possibly know something that I don't believe? But with regard to certainty, um, certainty is an expression of confidence. It tells you nothing at all about whether what you're expressing confidence in is true. And you can be more confident about some things than other things. As David Hume pointed out, the wise man apportions his belief to the evidence. And so that's what I mean by degrees of certainty. There are things that I just barely believe. 
And there are things that I very strongly believe, which is why I made a distinction between maximal certainty, which is founded upon the logical absolutes, which I think is as far as we can go so far. Maybe we can go further someday. Maybe someday a presuppositionalist will give us a demonstration of the foundation beyond the logical absolutes. But until then, I'm kind of stuck. And things that are inductive of those couldn't be uh, held to various degrees that I would consider reasonable certainty. This question is to Sai. I was wondering how a mind could possibly tell that it is God in order to say I am omnipotent or omniscient and then proceed to give revelations of absolute authority to other figures. How God knows he's God? Yeah. He's all knowing. I don't know. I don't know the process of it, but he's all knowing. Okay. Someone have a question for Matt? <laughs> this is actually for both of you, but I'd like Matt to answer first. What's the difference between saying something is and saying, I know something is. Wow, it's, it's difficult to unpack because we haven't, like, it's like I said it, d during the rebuttal, that no, to know or knowledge may in fact be an entirely useless label because it is, uh, so it's still an open question in philosophy. We're still trying to figure out exactly what knowledge is. And quite frankly, I think we're chasing, um, and I'm probably using the wrong word here, but a MacGuffin, something um, that we may not have any reason to chase. That maybe belief and rationally justified belief is all we could ever hope for. So when I say something is, I'm expressing my belief that this is consistent with reality as I experience it. Um, I'm fine with justified true belief and saying that I know that this is true within the reality I experience because it is justified by the foundations of reason and is apparently consistent with reality. And I believe it. So there's the three prongs. Well, for Sire, Matt. well, Matt says something is the case. What he's really saying is I know it's the case. But the thing is, he's going to want to say, I believe it's the case. <laughs> well, do me a favor, Matt. In the future, instead of saying something is the case, be consistent with your worldview and just say you believe it's the case. How about I say what I want? Okay, you can say what you want. But the thing is, the reason that you do that is because when I challenge, when you say something is the case, I say, do you know it? No, I just believe it. But you're saying it as though you know it, and that's you the just, problem. You just said that the re when I say something is the case, I'm saying I know it. And I just got done saying that when I say something is the case, I'm not saying Right, I but know the thing it. is, you ask so anybody. you know more about what's going on in my head than I do. Well, I'm saying that if, you, that right? if you did a survey of somebody who says, well, this so is the case. So you a liar? I saying if you're saying that this is the case, I don't you ask care a person, about the survey. You said what I meant. Hang on a second. If you, you said that right. I meant something. That's are right. you calling me a liar? Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad that's cleared up. Uh, well, if somebody says something is the case. Obviously, they're saying I know it's the case. Obviously. I'm not saying I believe it's okay. the case. Okay. Who, who's your question for? Uh, Adam from here in Tennessee. I actually would like to get both distinguished uh, debaters' response to this. There's two distinguished debaters? <laughs> <laughs> Arguable, right. Uh, just real quick, I am a former licensed minister myself, turned skeptic and agnostic atheist. Uh, represents a long journey that probably a lot of people here tonight may be familiar with. But I just wanted to get both of your response to the idea of um, what do you think about a situation in which people find themselves questioning everything that they've ever believed, regardless of what background they come from, uh, having basically a, a, a crisis of uh, worldview at some point in their life, which I'll give you my answer. I think it was one of the best things that ever happened to me, but I would like your responses, please. Yeah, me too. Um, I'm going to address this a little bit briefly in the closing. I'll just say it now. There's a quote from Bertrand Russell that says it's a good thing now and then to hang a question mark on things that you've long taken for granted. And I think that that is the key um, to a better understanding of yourself and of reality and, and reevaluating what I believed after I gave up my religion. Um, I, I, I think that's probably the best thing that ever happened to me. And, it, and I hear that from lots of people. Well, there's no question, doubt is a sin. But scripture also says, be merciful to those who doubt. But this thing is, when you're doubting something, you're doubting the truth of something. You're using your reason to doubt. You're using logic to doubt. What does it require to doubt the existence of God? It requires God to doubt, to doubt the existence of God. Because you, <laughs> you can't make sense of any of, of, those, of those without him. You can't make sense of truth, knowledge, logic, reason without God. So doubt presupposes God. And for those who are doubting, that will be a comfort. 
Hi, my question is for Sai. Um, Sai, uh, your arguments seem to revolve mostly around um, mocking and ad homininging Matt over. Give the, me an example, please. Let me finish my sentence and then I will. Over um, his statement that he could not disprove hard solipsism, which seems to imply to me that you have a disproof of hard solipsism, because if not, your mockery wouldn't make sense. So my question for you is, what is your disproof? A revelation from God. And, and I don't necessarily consider it mockery, but that's your opinion. Well, it's fine. That's not a disproof. It's, an, it's a justification for your personal belief. But in a debate, is that you true, have to sir? provide arguments and proofs slash disproofs, not explanations for your All personal beliefs. All of those presuppose beliefs. God. Um, Proof presupposes God. I believe God. in God, so that's okay with me. Everybody believes in God, sir. Cool. Even Satan. Fist bump. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Go Yeah. This uh, question is for Sai. Sai, um, you were saying that everybody has this almost kind of like, you know, when you open up a computer, it already comes prepackaged with Windows. <laughs> everybody has this, you know, belief in God. It's, right. it's there. Does that mean that everybody's saved? Absolutely not. Satan believes in God, as I just said to the previous questioner. D so the, the demons believe and tremble. So the. It's the mental ascension in addition to the knowledge that's already there. Everybody already believes, so they're, they're not automatically It's not a mental saved. ascension. They're, Satan what, mentally ascends that God exists. Well, then what is it that saves a human being from trust hell? Trust in the salvific word, work of Jesus Christ as a payment for the sins. Do you have to believe then? Because you already know, so... Well, the thing is you have to repent and believe, but repentance is the gift of God. Okay. It's not, something, it's not something that you could do at the end of an intellectual process. It's something that's granted to you. And that's what I urge people. If any of this moves them, they need to get on their knees and beg God to change their mind, to change their mind about who he is. Okay. <laughs> this is a question for Sai. Uh, my question is, is it possible that God has supplied you with a revelation that is, at least in part, false? And I have a specific example. I'm say, could God have lied to you about the path to heaven, and I'm going to use your phrasing here, for reasons that are sufficient to God? No. <laughs> and you know that. Yes, God cannot lie. Question for Sai: is there any experience or set of experiences that would change your position? No. Because, no, that, that's a very good question. Because the thing is, if I were to doubt my position, like I said, doubt presupposes the existence of God. Reason presupposes God. There is no way that I could change the position because it's a necessary foundation for reason. It's a foundation for questions. It's the foundation for truth. So I could not. It's impossible. Hey, Sai. Um, so let's say I'm standing between a Muslim apologist and you on the other right. side. And both of you claim to know that your God exists right. by divine revelation. How do I tell the difference? Well, I, I, just, uh, I just told you the refutation for Islam. I would say, what is your ultimate authority? It's the Quran. What does the Quran say about the Bible? A lot of Muslims don't know that. The Quran says the Bible is a previous revelation of God, of Allah, and it says that it's true. I say, why don't you believe it today? They say, it's been corrupted. I say, what does your Quran say about whether the words of God can be corrupted? And they say, no, they can't. See, that's the problem. If the Quran is true, the Bible is true. And because the Bible is true, the Quran is false. You want to have a question for Matt? You want to have a question for Matt? For what? For both? No, no, hold on. Just Matt? Go ahead, come up. Go ahead. Hi, Matt. I'm a former PK, and now I'm a neuroscientist at St. Jude. Oh, okay. I did research on schizophrenia. So the, you know, the whole concept of consciousness and, uh, and perception is, is very important to me as I think about schizophrenia and people that have, you know, that have hallucinations. Um, but we see we haven't talked too much about science tonight, um, unfortunately. We've talked about... I did a defense of it. We've talked a lot about philosophy. Mm. My question to you is, in the past 2,000 years of philosophy, can you identify something that has really advanced our knowledge or advanced our, our well-being? I can't. <laughs> so there's a... Go ahead. Because I know science certainly has philosophy. I'm not so sure. Yeah. Um, first of all, I, I'm, I'm engaged in philosophical discussions tonight because that's the topic, and this is, this is you know, and also I like it. Um, 
but uh, while I would, I would agree that you know, f philosophy is not, has not and is not likely to cure a disease or provide us with some benefit, it does serve, I think, philosophy is not some mystical thing out there that people are sitting around doing. What it really means is that we are thinking about and trying to use our reason to better understand the world. And I don't think you can do science without philosophy. I don't think without somebody like Karl Popper talking about investigating this to come up with the, the importance of falsification that you would get much benefit out of science. Certainly you could still get something out of the practical doing of science. Um, <laughs> Which, you know, which discipline would I rather we spend more time on? Science, all day, every day, all the time. Um, but I think it's important to have at least some minimal grounding in philosophy so that you understand um, where you understand fallacies. You understand that just because something hasn't been proved false that it means it's true. Matt, specifically the question was... Um an, an advancement that has come from philosophy. Can you name something? Yeah, no, I said there probably aren't any. Okay. I think I can do that later, but that I'll, I'll stick to my question. So, um, it's, it's interesting. Um, my, um, basically, I think this is, a, this is a transcendental cell argument. It's ide ideally that there are conditions for the possibility of other things. And the thing that you're really saying is that anybody who makes a claim about truth or knowledge has to, has to presuppose that God exists because that's a necessary condition for the possibility of the existence of truth, right? I, I take that to be your argument. Basically. And, and part of it being that the, way, the mechanism behind that is divine revelation. Right. So I see, there's, I see there's three parts to this argument, essentially. There's first the recognition of a divine being. There's second, the pathway of divine revelation as the epistemic warrant for that. And there's, you know, finally the, or initially the acknowledgement that truth exists. Okay, sorry. The question is, okay, so for any given religious tradition, and when I'm not just talking about Islam, I'm talking about, uh, you know, Zeus, uh, Thor, any given particular religious tradition, why can't they just fill in those boxes with their given X's, i.e., I believe the truth exists, I believe a necessary presupposition for that truth existing is that Thor exists, ergo, Thor, you know, Thor exists. What is your question? Well, my, my, my question is just why isn't that defense available to anyone from any religious, religious tradition, irrespective of time or place, and for that very reason, why doesn't that actually devolve into a form of intellectual solipsism? Well, the thing is, that defense is available, and I'll be happy to discuss anybody who claims that Zeus is their god, or who, who claims that the, uh, the uh, flying spaghetti monster, as you have in your shirts out here, if they want to claim that, I'll be happy to debate them. If people want to say that believing in God is necessary precondition for truth, I'll be happy to debate them. But the thing is, that's not what he's saying tonight. I'll be happy to debate anybody who has any other claim as a necessary foundation for truth. I'll be happy to debate anybody. I'm saying that no other gods exist because that's what the Bible says. All the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. See, I'm, people say sometimes, you know, you're atheistic towards all those other gods. No, I'm not. There are no other gods. I'm not an idolater. Uh, my question's for Cy. This question is a bit similar to the last question. Mm -hmm. So I've been to your website, Proof That God Exists, and I read through your proof, and you state that in order for us on Earth as humans to have absolutes of any sense, absolute truth, morals, logical truths, there needs to be some sort of absolute outside of our, of our existence of humans. Um, let's just grant that for the moment. Um, so how do you get to, from this uh, needs to be absolute somewhere else to this is a being who is a god as opposed to some nebulous absolute force out there to this is the Christian god of the Bible other than your personal revelation? That's a great question and it's a, it's a huge misunderstanding of the argument. I'm not saying logical absolutes are absolutes of any kind therefore God. I'm saying you must start with the God of Christianity, the only God exists, that exists in order to make sense of any absolutes. It's not absolutes, therefore God, it's God, therefore absolutes. <coughs> my question's for both of you, but I'd like to see Matt answer it last. Um, my question is, if the um, God of the Bible exists, does he owe us questioning fallible human beings something, anything? No. Matt? I don't know. It depends on what you mean by does he owe. I'm, if, we assume, if I assume right now that, for example, the God of the Bible I exists, 
There are certainly a great many things that I would like, like, oh, I don't know, answers. Uh, but I don't feel that I'm owed anything. Um, but I also don't feel that I owe anything. All right, this is for Sai as well. As a Christian, does your doctor not state to be kind to other human beings? Um, well, I don't know. You'd have to quote the verse. I don't do verses, bro. As a Christian, are you supposed to be kind First to Peter other people? 3.15. There you go. Thank you. You're First welcome. First Peter 3.15. <laughs> so, Sai. Be prepared to give a re answer. Be prepared to give a reason for the faith that's within you. I, really, I know the word. Gentleness and kindness. No, actually, gentleness and respect, but... Well, it okay, depends so on which translation. Do we want to argue about translations? Mm -hmm. I pulled a verse out. As a Christian, you're supposed but you didn't to say respect kindness. other people, correct? I respect other people. Okay. I don't do respect their views. Do you think that mocking your opponent instead of presenting an argument in your first two rounds of resolutions instead of mocking him were respectful? Well, there is a place for, for righteous mockery. I don't think that I, I was mocked. Really? I don't think that I... Yeah, there is. Yes. See, because uh, when Elijah was uh, on, on uh, Mount Karma with the, the prophets of Baal, and, and he said, you know, cast, uh, burn up, this, uh, burn up this, uh, this altar, this pile of wood here, and they didn't do it. Elijah sits and where's your God? Is he busy? And the, euf the Hebrew euphemism that was used there, is he on the toilet? Yeah. So there is a place for righteous mockery. I don't, say, I don't think that I, Matt doesn't even think that I mocked him. I don't think. I don't, I don't necessarily consider it mockery, but I wouldn't care if you did mock. I, it's, it, yeah. it, it wounds me I, not one bit. I think there's, there's a place for it, but I don't think I engaged in it. If I felt that I was owed an apology, I would definitely have uh, said so. But. All right, my question is for Matt. Yeah. Uh, on my drive down, I listened to an audio copy of uh, Bart Ehrman's Misquoting Jesus. Yeah. And it made me really wonder about how accurate any of the information or any of the words in the Bible that are being currently used uh, are. Uh, do you think it's reasonable for someone to base an entire worldview, religious philosophy, on the current Bible because of how different it is from any of its oldest sources. Yeah, so there's one little thing to correct there before I say the no, which I'm going to say, uh, which is that there's not a current Bible. Um, so Ehrman, Ehrman's got some, some good books, and uh, studying the history of both the canon and trying to determine how reliable the current text is to the original is something that lots of Christian theologians and New Testament scholars, whether they believe or not, uh, have been engaged in. And the truth is that we don't know the how truth. close the Bible is to the original. Um, and what's, what's more significant to me is that it doesn't matter if it was 100% you know, accurate to the original, because the question is, is the original true? Is the new, current version we get? We have no reason to think, think that any of them uh, are true except where they, you know, where they are. When they talk about, you can find all kinds of facts and place names and, you know, if archaeologists dig up New York in the future, that doesn't mean that Spider-Man existed. And so you have to take each individual claim in the Bible separately. And so the idea that someone could base, should, would base their worldview entirely on what uh, a, any particular Bible that they got their hands on now says is, to me, absurd. Now, if they can go and investigate and, and make a demonstration that there's some truth there, and if they can demonstrate a mechanism, even if it was divine revelation, if they could demonstrate that they had this revelation and that this led, led to truth, then you've got a different issue. But absent that, I don't think anybody should base their life on any book. So he's talking about truth again, not belief. Uh, my question's for Cy. Yep. Uh, currently, it's just a... Uh, currently, it's estimated that there's about 350,000 versions of Christianity. So how exactly do you know that your version is the correct one? I never claimed that. I'm saying that there are things in the peripheral that I could be wrong about. But the essentials, all Christians agree on. And if there are people who say that the essentials are different, that's where we go to Scripture and that's what we study. So you don't? I don't know about all the peripherals. I know the essentials. Can I know you, that everyone knows that God exists. Can you briefly I know that tell, everyone needs Jesus Christ. I know that. Can you briefly tell us the essentials? <laughs> yeah, I'll, well, I can tell you that in my concluding statement. Okay. But okay. The, the essentials are that we are created in the image of God to represent him on this earth, and we have failed to do so. We want to be God. And the essential is that that has put us in enmity with the God that has created us. And the essential is that Jesus Christ, God sent his son to pay that price for sinners like you and me. And if you put your trust in him, then you can have an eternal life with him in heaven. Uh, this is from Mr. Delahani again. Um, oh, thanks. 
Yeah, my question is, in your opening remarks, you said that uh, presuppositionalists like Sai never offer arguments. And I'm just wondering if you're familiar with transcendental arguments, if you've done any kind of written work uh, interacting with transcendental arguments, and if you agree that transcendental arguments even are arguments, because I know there is some discussion about that in the philosophical community, if they really are arguments. But if you think they're actual arguments, are they actual arguments, and have you interacted with like Barry Stroud, uh, P.F. Strawson, and Robert Stern, and others who have secular versions of transcendental arguments, or is it just Van Tilian style transcendental arguments that you disagree with? Thank you. So, first of all, I'll, I'll correct what I said in my opening, because obviously Sy did present an argument in, in the beginning, uh, two premises and a conclusion. Um, sound, I don't know, but valid, it seemed to be valid in form remembering it. With regard to, and I think, by the way, that this is tag. This is a version of the transcendental argument for the existence of God. It is, um, I think, an armature version of it. Uh, and on the show, Matt Slick, who has a, runs CARM.org and has put together a written version of the transcendental argument, he called in a couple of times, and we had a 45-minute kind of debate on the show. And you hung uh, up on him. Where... <laughs> I, yes, after 45 minutes, find a radio show. Would you shut up? I'm answering a question. <laughs> uh, we, we, we went through every aspect of, of Matt's version of uh, TAG, and I pointed out where I disagreed. And then the next day, he went and edited his site to correct the point that I had pointed out was flawed. The problem is that Matt didn't understand why it was flawed, and so when he corrected it, he made it worse. And then when people went over to his forum to ask him about this, he said, uh, well, we don't need to get into to all that. In any case, he tried to de declare victory and all that. And I don't care about, about that stuff. As far as other versions, secular versions of TAG, I would be very interested in a secular transcendental argument for the existence of God, for example, because uh, I mean, that, the, the, the subject alone intrigues me. And you can email me at tv at atheist-community.org. One and thing I'd, I'd love encourage to people to do too is go to the Atheist Experience website, look for show 593 where Matt was on, where Matt Slick was on for 45 minutes of a one-hour show. See if his name is mentioned. Then after that, go to their YouTube channel and see where their archive of shows starts, show 594, and ask yourself why that's the case. So we stop archiving shows and making them available to people for free after a certain period of time because we have a limit on storage space and we sell compilation DVDs to help, DVDs to help pay for the production of this. Um, the entire episode is still available online. And Matt Slick is not mentioned. His name appears on the screen, on the little bar. If you go to the archive page and you Guys, search, we have three minutes left. Do a search for Matt Slick, you will not find Matt Slick mentioned yes, on that show. Yes, because it's not my job to promote Matt Slick. Sue me. All right, we have three minutes. Let's try to keep it really short. An earlier question was given uh, about whether or not the democracy was a good form of government, and uh, it was suggested that... That's not what the question a, was, but... It was, would a Christian theocracy be a, be a better form? Absolutely. So what I want to know is, do you feel that you and like-minded people have as a goal the goal of overthrowing the United States and replacing it with a Christian theocracy? No. I have a goal that people become saved. That people become saved and put their trust in Jesus Christ, and there, then they will elect a Christian government. But the thing is, I don't think it should be top down. I think it should be bottom up. I've got something completely, totally different. It's for both of you. Who is your favorite fictional superhero? <laughs> I like Spider-Man. Yahweh. Yahweh. <laughs> God is not mocked. What you sow, you will reap. Yeah, that's true. Sai. Batman probably. Can you be wrong about anything that you think you know? About anything I think I know? Absolutely. Or, so how do you know that that one thing might not mess up your whole worldview? Because I know something for certain. There's things that I, that I not merely think I know. But if you but don't know, know them, then how do you know? No, that no, there's a difference between what I think I know and what I know. I could be wrong about things I think I know. I can't be wrong about what I know. You, so, so what you know, you, you know... Absolutely. Knowledge, knowledge is so defined you know as everything. True. No, I don't know anything. I know. I don't know. You don't everything. know anything. I know some things. What do you? I don't know, know everything. I know some things. You know, I know that God things. exists, and, and I know everything he... you know is absolutely right. Part of me. And everything, everything you claim anybody you knows know is absolutely right. Everything anybody knows is true, by definition. Knowledge is true. 
So, but that's why I don't say, could you, you be wrong know, about... You do know that they don't contradict your worldview. Well, here's the question. That's why I don't say, could you be wrong about everything you know? I say, could you be wrong about things you think you know? There's a big difference. All right, we'll close tonight. Each speaker gets two minutes for a closing. It's five, I thought. Five? I have two here on mine. Is it five? He can have five. I, I thought it was five. I got, I got two. Okay. Two. Sarah, you're fine with that? Sorry, I'll set the timer for five minutes. I can't imagine anybody who more sincerely sought this revelation that you claim is, you. is, ha is common than I did. So did I just not try hard enough all those years? Matt says he can't think of anybody who sought this revelation more earnestly than he did. But what does Matt think about God? You know, oh, you know, I'm sure I've, I'm going to irritate a bunch of Christians of, oh, you're, you're placing yourself above God. You bet your ass. I'm way above the guy that, you, that your book describes, both with regard to my moral positions and, and I'd have to say intellect. I'll say that if the Bible is an accurate representation of God, then even if I absolutely knew he existed, um, I would consider him an immoral thug of inferior intellect and wouldn't worship him. You see, that's right, you can clap, you can clap if you want, but God will not be mocked. You see, Matt said that he sought God, sought God more earnestly than anybody. I got some advice for you. If you're looking for God, don't look beneath you. Look above you. Where did that first happen? That first happened that somebody put themselves above God in the Garden of Eden. God gave Adam and Eve a beautiful garden. He said, just do not eat of the tree, of the fruit of this one tree. And Satan came along and said, hath God really said that? He's holding out on you. If you eat of that tree, you're going to be just like him. And what did Adam and Eve do? They said, well, God said this. Satan said this. I'm going to choose. All of you who are atheists here today are doing the same thing. God said this. He said, this is how we're supposed to have pleasure. I've granted you, I've granted you this beautiful, that you can have pleasure this way. You can have it this way. And Satan's coming along and say, God's holding out on you. I want to have it this way. I want to have it this way. I want to have it this way. And you as atheists are saying, well, God said this. Satan said this. I'm going to choose. You're putting yourself above God. You're putting yourself at enmity with God. You see, stealing is not wrong because it makes people mad. Stealing is wrong because God is not a thief. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Each and every one of us. Our sin demands an eternity in hell because of how good God is. Sin is not a measure of how bad you are. It's a measure of how good you're not. All of us deserve an eternity in hell. Myself included. I'm not better than anybody here. I came here. I'm not better than anybody here, but I put my trust in Jesus Christ. So I'm better off if you haven't done that. And I urge you to do that. Because without him, all you can do is follow Matt. If he, doesn't, if he dies unrepentant, follow him into hell. And I tell you, you're not going to enjoy it there. People are going to say, I'm going to get away from God. You know what? You know who rules in hell? God rules in hell, not Satan. You see, I'm not saved from Satan. I'm saved from the wrath of Almighty God. But God in his love, in his love, sent his son to pay the price for the sin that I deserve. He paid that price by dying on a Roman a cross, a, a bloody death, a, a painful, horrible death. And that is offered here tonight. See, that's your offer. That's the offer. Jesus Christ or absurdity. But you'll probably walk out of here choosing absurdity because you love your sin. But you know what? Your conscience is on my side. You all know that God exists. I urge you, repent. Put your trust in Jesus Christ before it's too late. Because you will not like your eternity in hell. I urge you. And I do this as a friend. Like I say, I, it's too bad that these debates have to happen like this because I would like to clear up a lot of Matt's uh, misconceptions. I'd like to do it in a more friendly tone. But the problem is Matt is up here blaspheming God because when you say you don't know that God exists, you're calling God a liar. And you know, if somebody came up here and said, you know, I think your wife is a prostitute, I wouldn't be discussing about the finer points of marriage. I'd say, you better be careful. When you come up here and you say you don't believe that God exists, you're blaspheming him. This is not just some fun philosophical debate. You can laugh all you want, but God is not mocked. What you sow, you will reap. But there is hope. There is hope in Jesus Christ. And I urge you to repent and put your trust in him for salvation. Thank you.
Matt, would you like the two minutes agreed upon or five minutes? Oh, give me five. It'll come up short. I, I added about a minute here to my two. Okay. Just you because. Have five minutes. Yeah, sure. When I said in the clip that I couldn't imagine anyone who tried harder than I did, and then there's another clip where I talk about God being inferior, um, there's a before and after there. I changed my mind. When I was a Christian, I believed and I loved God, and I was willing to dedicate my life to presenting the truth of Jesus to everyone. Um, I changed my mind. That happens. It's not the only clip, by the way, that misrepresents the order of things or stops short of clarity, but I'm fine with what he presented. After all, I got to speak way more than he did. <laughs> when you say that my wife is a prostitute, I'm going to ask you for evidence. Because that's what my worldview is based on. I'm not going to get irate. I'm not going to tell you you better watch Your it. Your wife will. <laughs> no, actually, my wife won't. And if you'd stop pretending to know my wife while I'm in my closing, when you clearly don't, how do you know my wife's not a Let prostitute? Let me give you evidence she's not a prostitute. <laughs> How do you know my wife's not a... Never mind, this is my closing. He says, you can follow me to hell. Well, I'm telling you, apart from Twitter and Facebook, don't follow me. Follow reason, follow the evidence, follow it wherever it leads. Don't make any heroes. I'm nothing special. I'm just somebody who spent some time studying, and I'm up here talking about it. Presuppositionalists don't debate. They claim to have solved the biggest problems in philosophy while asserting that they cannot possibly be wrong and that no other worldview can do this, but they don't demonstrate the truth of the claim that no other worldview can do this. They shift the burden of proof and want you to prove that you can, when what we're really saying is that we don't have evidence that anybody can, including you. They have no interest in demonstrating that belief in God is reasonable, which is the subject of this debate, a subject that I'd argue only one of us actually addressed. They're only interested in claiming that you can't reason if, you don't, if there is no God. Well, how can they demonstrate the truth of this? I have no idea. But they've removed themselves from the realm of debate when they make unsupported claims, including the claim that they're certain and can't be wrong. This isn't how debates are done. Kindergarten theology coupled with kindergarten philosophy, presuppositionalism is the equivalent of sticking your fingers in your ear and refusing to listen to reason. When your debate practice is to just repeatedly make claims and ask, could you be wrong about that? How do you know that? In order to get people to admit, honestly, that they're not certain of everything or perhaps anything, you're not engaged in debate. When challenged on clear, repeated appeals to absolute certainty and your response is that you're not really concerned about absolute certainty, the dishonesty is transparent. Saying that you could be wrong doesn't mean that you are wrong and doesn't tell us anything about whether or not you're wrong. The reason that certainty wasn't relevant in this debate, or in fact to knowledge, is that certainty is not a measure of the truth of a claim, it is the measure of the individual's confidence in the claim. Bertrand Russell said the trouble with the world is that the stupid are cocksure and the intelligent are full of doubt. There are big questions in this world, some of them may forever be beyond our ken, but some of them appear to be discoverable. At this point, I see no reasonable justification for believing that God exists, the subject of this debate. And I also see no reasonable justification for why anyone should ever again waste time debating someone who has no interest in debate, but wants to merely claim that you're wrong because they're convinced that they have a special friend who ensures that they cannot be wrong. And that is the debate from May 31st in Memphis between Matt Dillahunty and Sign 10 Bruggen Kate again. The video version is available and linked in the description box of this podcast. Next Tuesday night, a very special show with a very special guest, Dr. Carolyn Porco. It's a planetary scientist who has worked on the Voyager missions to Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune in the 80s and currently leads the imaging scientist team on the Cassini mission currently in orbit around Saturn. We're going to talk about space exploration, science versus anti-science, and this amazing new age of discovery that you and I are privileged to be alive in. That's next Tuesday night. Tonight's broadcast has been brought to you by Nature Box. Great tasting, healthy snacks. Forget the vending machine. Get in shape with delicious treats like barbecue kettle kernels and a whole lot more. Support this show. You get 50% off your first order. Go to naturebox.com slash thinking atheist. That's naturebox.com slash thinking atheist. Follow the thinking atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on the thinking atheist YouTube channel and visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. The thinking atheist.com.